Old School Lane Casual Chats is brought to you by OldSchoolLane.blogspot.com and is associated with Channel Frederator, Manic Expression, The Comic Book Cast, and The Araminta Show. Welcome to a brand new episode of Casual Chats. I am Patricia, and I'm here with a few special guests. Returning from this particular podcast, we have Jim Bevan, who's been in many podcasts. Welcome back, Jim. Hi are See? Hi are Good to be back, Patty. And uh, we have both Zenith Will Rule and Deshinta, who was recently on the Fully Cooley podcast. So welcome back, guys. Glad to be on. You know, I'm I'm Power Rangers is my childhood, so I'm ready to discuss. I'm 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 ready. It's more phenomenal. <laughs> it's morphin time. Did it actually come through? Yes, that did. Yes, come through. <laughs> that was amazing. Thank you so much. That was awesome. Yes, it was. And last but certainly not least, we have the marvelous in red, or Captain Marvelous. So welcome, Marvelous. Hi, it's a pleasure to be here. So, today, if you guys didn't hear from Zenith's awesome intro, we're going to be discussing about Power Rangers. On August 28th, 1993, that was when Mighty Morphin Power Rangers debuted on TV, and now it has been 25 years since the franchise has hit North America, and we're going to be talking all about almost pretty much every single incarnation and very similar to the Yu-Gi-Oh podcast since I only know about briefly the first series and uh and maybe like bits and pieces of everything else then I'm just gonna let these guys just talk the rest so uh right before we get into the discussion of Power Rangers um well how did we first get introduced to it so Marvelous since you're our new guest why don't you start uh, I watched Jetman as a kid when I was overseas, uh, but I didn't really understand that it was a really a franchise until I watched Mighty Morphin when I came back to the U.S., and that's when I it kind of clicked on me, though, oh, there's a new one every year. Oh, when you were, in the, when you were at overseas, um, were you familiar with the Super Sentai franchise, or was Jetman kind of like your first introduction to that particular franchise? When I was a kid, I understand Tokusatsu. There was like Ultraman and Kamen Rider. Um, I always thought of them as like one series, so I didn't really understand that Sentai was its own thing, separate from Kamen Rider and Ultraman. I just assumed they were all like different shows under the same, uh, you know, company, but not uh, they didn't have specific franchises unique to each of them. It wasn't until Mighty Morphin came out and I saw them uh, adapt each season that I realized, oh, so you know, this each um, there's a franchise behind the Power Rangers, which was Super Sentai. Dashinta, how did you get introduced to Power Rangers? Fox Kids Watcher when I was four, Day of the Dumpster. Ah, that's a classic. Um, how about you, uh, Zenith? How did you first get introduced to Power Rangers? Um, I, I watched Power Rangers as a kid also. Uh, I used to watch on Fox Kids or WB or like ba- basically I would watch as I grew older. And I wasn't really aware that this was um a japanese product i mean it's obvious now but as a kid i didn't realize that they were cutting together japanese footage with original fighting footage um and it's like i I didn't really know that what super sentai was at the time 
Uh, okay. Nowadays, I uh, nowadays I know like you know I know Common Rider, I know Garo, I know uh, Super Sentai, and I, I know the stuff that uh, a lot of people don't really know about. But as a kid, I was just I I was intrigued because I I liked martial arts. I did karate as a kid, so it was just something that I would watch, and it would actually give me new ideas to like you know um, try out new moves and stuff like that. And um, I I just. I really gravitated to the show. Uh, I, I found it uh, enjoyable, and I, I watched for quite a long time, although not as long as uh, some people. Because, I mean, granted, I, I, when it first came out, I was pretty little because I'm 28 now, so I I was probably what like three. <laughs> yeah, I think that's yeah. I think that would be the case. Yeah. Um, I'm back now. Yeah, go ahead, Jim. You, now, now you you're back. Talk. Sorry about that. I don't know why I have these problems just playing Skype. No, it's okay. Um, go ahead, Jim. Why don't you tell your story? Well, I saw uh, some preview commercials for Power Rangers a few weeks before it started, and it just looked interesting to me. You know, cool monsters, superheroes fighting. It seemed like everything that would be up my alley. And I watched, and, you know, it was simple, but, you know, I was only like eight years old at the time, so it supplied, supplied all my needs. And I kept watching season after season. I admit, when I was younger, I only just watched it mainly for the monsters. I wanted to see how cool they could be, what new evil scheme they'd have, how the Rangers would beat it. But as I got older, I got to appreciate the complexities of some of the other seasons, like how deep uh, Lost Galaxy and In Space and Time Force could get. And it wasn't until around uh, Lost Galaxy that I actually learned that it was from a Japanese series. Yeah. Um, I didn't know about this until, um, you know, the whole Japanese series thing until many years later. I think that when I was in college, I was when I first got introduced to it because I had a friend who was like obsessed with Gundam and he would just tell me about that. Oh, did you know that it was based off of the Super Sentai series? And I'm like, what? And then, you know, he showed I think he showed me like um, a bit torrent episode of Cure Sentai Zero Ranger. Um, that, you know, was Japanese with English fan subs, and I was, like, my mind was, like, literally blown away. And this was, like, from somebody who isn't exactly, like, fully engraved into the Power Rangers franchise. I remember that I, you know, I was watching it because everybody that I knew in school was watching it, and then I I eventually saw the movie, and then when they were moving on to, like, the new series, like, the new Power Rangers in the second movie, I kind of, like, lost interest. That, I mean, I pretty much stayed away from it for the longest time until when I was doing the Nickelodeon tribute, and then I learned that Nickelodeon was gaining the rights to the Power Rangers franchise, and I and at that time I thought, oh man, that means I have to go back to Power Rangers and I have to review Samurai and Mega Force, which eventually at that point I never got around to because I just stopped. Our oh. condolences. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like, imagine that. Imagine me who had watched the original and the newest version that I got back to with Power Rangers was Super was Samurai. Which I hear is yeah, actually that's one not of the best. Yeah, <laughs> poor me. I mean, I have a little bit of a different history in that regard because I watched it as a kid for a very long time, um, but I didn't always watch in order. Like I watched um, everything up until Space um, as a kid, but after a while, like I I was watching like reruns on Jetix and stuff like that, so I would catch seasons here and there. Um, and it's just like, okay, I would skip one season. I didn't see a lot of Lost Galaxy. I saw like bits and pieces, but then I saw, um, not, and, and I didn't, I didn't watch too, too much of, um, Lightspeed Rescue because I thought it was stupid at the time. Um, I'm not a really big fan of that season in general, uh, but you it's just. You blasting, my friend. Yeah, I, I, I just didn't like the villains and I didn't like the concept of a civilian task force at the time. Um, so the next thing I watched was Time Force, and I thought Time Force was great. Time Force got me back into the series. I watched all of Time Force. I watched all of Wild Force, because Wild Force I thought was great. And then from there, I was just watching it again. I, I saw, uh, uh, what was the next one? Uh, it was uh, Ninja Storm. Ninja Storm. 
Ninja Storm. I liked Ninja Storm. I watched Dino Thunder. Um, I thought that was great, but then I kind of fell off for a little bit. Um, I, I think the reruns that they were showing were like backed up by a couple seasons because I didn't know Mystic Force was a thing. But then I started seeing things for Operation Overdrive, and I'm like, okay, there's they're premiering a new series. I'm kind of caught up. Let, let's let's see it. I watched that first episode, and I stopped watching Power Rangers from that point onward again our condolences no one uh, yet. uh i mean th- that that's why i loved link Cara's review of that specific season because that's like the worst in my opinion but you know um i've heard good things about later like later seasons i hear rpm is great but it's just like i've i kept being pulled out of it as time went on and then getting pulled back in and every time i think i'm out they pull me back in that's what she said. Ah, Jeff. Or he said. Sure. Either way. Who cares? I don't care. <laughs> but still, that was a bad joke. <laughs> well, anyway, I um, I think that before we get into the main meat of Power Rangers, I'm actually curious about if you guys have ever seen any of the previous Super Sentai series, like before Power Rangers, like maybe out of curiosity, we're like, oh, I wonder what the 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 Super Sentai series from like the 60s and 70s were. So, does anybody have any story on that? Oh my! No, actually, not it's, me. It's, it's funny you should mention that. I actually have a channel where I'm reviewing the old series, starting from Go Ranger, which was 1975, I think. Wow. 1974, yeah. I believe, and okay. then it ran for over two years, and then there yeah, was 84 episodes. Jock. Yeah. So right now I'm on battle. Uh, right now I just finished Battle Fever J. I'm I'm probably going to put my review of Denji Man to- out tomorrow or Monday. I'm working on the script right now, actually. Nice. Oh, nice. Yeah. If I can have your link to your YouTube channel, I'd like to listen to your opinion on that. Yeah. Sure. It's just YouTube.com/slash Marvelous and Red. Yeah. Mm. Uh, as as always, I'll leave everybody's links in the description box below so you can check out their work. I, I eventually would like to watch some of the older stuff, especially Super Sentai. Um, I had been meaning to go back and watch Common Rider a long time ago. It just, I don't have a lot of time, and unfortunately, One Piece takes a lot of it. That's so, um, but eventually I will. I just need to find the fan subs because unfortunately, it's not very easy and it's not readily available. And there are sometimes several groups, and you don't know the quality contrasts outside of some people that will have biased perspectives on it. I hear that. I mean, I know some people who just tell me not to do some some subs that, for for, for my opinion, like they they weren't bad at all, but like they were just slightly askew. And I'm just like, okay, like some people are passionate about that. I feel like if if it gets the point across, I'm fine. Yeah, that's that's the main thing. Some people have uh, crim- uh, like criminalize and slander groups that basically any fan subs from the 2000s, most people cannot get the transcripts. So you're supposed to give them a little leeway in bats. Unfortunately, when 2010s came around, people started getting the transcripts. It became a whole big thing of pointed this thing and say, this is actually wrong. This proves it. Ignoring that, well, you didn't have that resource back then. Especially because interpretation and context is also important. Yeah, we've also had the problem of a lot of of some subtitlers preferring a dub title-esque method in that they don't care what was said, period, and just rewrite it to whatever the hell they want, even if some story ends up being built up atop that specific phrasing choice. And unfortunately, that has uh, been a... It's been a problem. Yeah, so our, I, I think the Fully Coolie these... podcast, you already stated that already about various dubs and various subtitle versions. Again, I apologize for that rant. That was a bit out of line on my part. That's all right. I mean, but, hey, it, it gave context in case anybody was interested. Yeah. Regarding Super Sentai, there's actually not that many subs for um, the earlier seasons. Like, um, I don't think there was a sub for Jacka. For ba- uh, for Go Ranger, there was a sub that only lasted until episode thirty four. There's no subs at all for Denji Man, um, so I had to watch the entirety of Denji Man in Japanese. Wow! Yeah. Can, you, can you understand Japanese? <laughs> yes, I'm fluent in Japanese and Chinese. Oh awesome. wow! Nice. Yeah, I know there a are lot. a few. Yeah, most 80. of 
the Showa Super Sentai series have been picked up, but never been completed for various reasons. The most consistent about that has been the group Grown Ups in Spandex, who actually did the uh, Jetman subs, which are going down because Shot Factory is licensing that series. And they're usually pretty high quality. It's just it takes them forever to release stuff. The rest of them are just a bunch of people who are, come out of nowhere and try it, but aren't don't get the chance to be that consistent about it. Basically, Another, everything from Jetman onwards, um, the 16th series is U Ranger, where MMPR syncs up. That uh, from Jetman onwards have had completed subtitles for them. And Shot Factory has gotten through Time Ranger at this point. Mm -hmm. I yeah, know, we should like, probably say that if you want to support Super Sentai, you should buy the Shot Factory uh, release releases. Unfortunately, the translations for the Shot Factory sets are, well, let's just say it, they're crap. Several of the fans of translators have actually done a quite better job. And about two weeks ago... Um, Megan, with the group Millionful Curiosity, who provided the second translation of Ginga Man, Lost Galaxy's um, uh, source material, like went on a massive rant about how bad Ginga Man's translation was. And ironically, it mirrored a bit of a breakdown I had over that months ago when the Ginga Man set released. So it's not like just a fan's perspective. People who put time and effort into getting everything right is looking at these sets and saying, how do you get this wrong? Yeah, I mean, you'd think that Toei would have at least provided Shout Factory with the scripts. No, it's Toei. I mean, we, we've established that they do things that they probably shouldn't. Uh, I, I think the big thing Shout Factory is good at is collecting things in sets because their their MMPR stuff is really good. Um, the video quality varies in some of the sets, but yes. Yes, uh, but it just, it, it's very hard with with, with uh, people who do fan subs because I know there was a lot of the push with uh, Kamen Rider. Uh, there are some seasons of that that are not fully translated and that people are working on. And I see like people are like, oh, we're, we're doing this episode and doing that, this episode. It's an effort. It is a huge, like, it takes time to do in groups. Um, doing a uh, series that have been going on for a very long time um, get burnt out. It's it's like you get the, the good ones take for a, a while to come out, and a lot of the obscure titles just do not get subtitled, unfortunately. Right. Uh, 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 again, in, yeah, in somewhat of a refusion of a defense of Shout Factory, like, they could get some help with that from using some of these fan servers as a basis for their work. And we know they could do this because Discotech is releasing another uh, Tokusatsu series called Just Beyond, which is from the Metal Heroes franchise. And the basis for their translation is actually going to be an existing fan sub from a group called Mega Beast Empire. They're actually being credited in everything. So they could certainly contact these groups to find a basis for their work to not potentially screw it up. And yet they haven't, and it seems like their work has been getting worse over time. Yeah. To be fair, there might be something uh, that might have something to do with Toei. That is very true. But currently, you can just buy the box sets and get the transcripts from those. I guess that's fair. Okay, so, so I think bottom line from the original Sentai is that sometimes, for the most part, it's pretty hard to come by, especially like a fan translated sub or the official sub. So if you are very lucky to check it out out of curiosity, it is available, but it's going to be really tough to look for. So I guess now after almost 20 minutes, I guess we can finally start talking about the, the series that we did eventually get in America. So let's start off with the original Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. <laughs> So I think I don't think we really need to give a major introduction as to what Power Rangers is. I'm sure for maybe our younger audiences who may have been introduced to maybe like the later incarnations of Power Rangers, but essentially it's just the same. You have five teenagers. They live in this town in California called Angel Grove. Teenagers with attitude. Oh yeah, that's right. Teenagers <laughs> with extreme attitude. 
nine hundred thousand years. There. I'm free. Yeah, get, yeah. Find five overbearing, um, over emotional uh, human beings. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and this was like before Dawson's Creek. Pretty much just like try to cap, you know, um, capitalize on the fact of let's have extremely emotive very uh, angsty teenagers and let's just give them a show and talk about everything that they're going through but instead of that and you know we have like teenagers who have superpowers uh, essentially so you have these teenagers and you have this evil villain by the name of Rita Repulsa who has been freed after 10,000 years and she's going to conquer earth they're summoned by Alpha 5 and Zordon and they get the ability to turn into the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers based off of um, creatures from the, um, you know, prehistoric times like Macedons and Tyrannosaurus and saber tooth Tigers and so on and so forth. And so they become the Power Rangers and basically it's more like a uh, villain, you know, like a monster of the week kind of show in which like you have Rhea Repulsa, she wants to take over the world and the Rangers try to stop her and then she sends out her monster of the week and then it, you know, the Power Rangers succeed by getting the Megazord and then basically just rinse and repeat and and there's usually some lesson of the day for the kitties yes <laughs> or some the... end of the day same jeff yeah pretty much so i mean it is the 90s they usually have to have like that sort of moral message in which you know they have to offset the violence with you know teaching a lesson or a moral so that it doesn't like go into the you know the the you know the whole controversy meetings with parents saying like we're introducing our kids to violent things and you know this 99 1993 i mean this was like around the time in which like you know you had mortal Kombat coming out and this was kind of like our first one of our first introductions into like you know japanese programs being brought into america i mean we had akira we had speed racer and we had like various yes. others but this was like one of the first like major hits that I remember, in, you know, in terms of like something that came from another country and it became a huge popular thing in America. And um, it's before you expected characters to have character arcs in an episodic series. Yeah, exactly. For the most and part, it, um, I think that's why a lot of people gravitated more of, of Dragon Ball Z, in which it's like, oh man, you know, a character, you know, they have they have conflicts going on. And also, this character died, and we get to follow about what they're going through, and it's going to continue on throughout the next episode. i got to keep watching. So, I, the same thing with Power Rangers. Even though that is very episodic, there's actually story going on. Mm -hmm. And it, it's interesting be because uh, Saban had this pitch for a very, very long time. He shopped this around for ages, and nobody wanted to pick it up. Yeah. Um, but but well, somehow... The original source Sentai he wanted to use was Bioman. If you've ever seen Bioman, that and a lot of the other early Sentai from the 70s and 80s could get incredibly violent. Imagine how the Mortal Guardians would have reacted to the stock footage of, you know, civilians being gunned down by the mooks. That uh, and some of the characters yeah. actually, as, as in main characters, actually died yeah. on screen while using their powers. It was only happened a couple times in that, but yeah... Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the, the history of Super Sentai being adapted into Power Rangers or being attempted to, Stanley actually tried to adapt some Vulcan, which was like the fifth Super Sentai. Uh, he shopped it around, uh, even to places like HBO, but they all passed. In yeah. fact, it's because of Stan Lee that we even got Super Sentai past the second series. The, second, the third Super Sentai, the third that is now counted as Super Sentai series was Battle Fever J, which was in part a marvel production that they technically backed out of that's why all of the the characters the main heroes from that are all nationality based because it was more so as to be something like captain america and then heroes of all these other countries yeah. kind of a shame they never held on to that uh agreement between Toei and marvel because it would have been so awesome to see power rangers show up in infinity war yeah, <laughs> well, we got Spider-Man, and Spider-Man was the, really the impetus from it because of the 1978 Spider-Man series, the one where he got his giant robot. I'm still upset that we had the Super Sentai, like the ulti ultimate like 20th anniversary team-up that was amazing in Japan, and they botched it completely in we'll America. We'll get to that later, but Zen. <laughs> yeah, which one you're referring to? They've had a several anniversaries. They've completely. Oh, uh, I think he's referring to Super Mega Force. Oh, uh, I, yeah. I actually did see that one. Yeah. 
we we're our condolences yeah yeah and as of the making of this uh podcast uh the new one that's going to be coming out the new 25th anniversary reunion special hasn't been out yet so we cannot state our and our opinions on that mm-hmm. no positive expectations simply due to precedence on my on my behalf mm. mm. Uh, All right. So um, now that we um, briefly discuss about Power Rangers, um, you know, just play this this particular series, like the first series, and knowing that, you know, it was going to be continuing on even still to this day. Um, how do you consider this ranked among like the better Power Rangers series? Do you, I mean, after like twenty five years later, even though that it came out in a time in which when you know introducing this Japanese franchise to Americans was sort of like a new thing. If you don't mind, I'd like to go first on this. Sure, go ahead. On a scale of 1 to 10, I rate it 3 out of 10, with it being the threshold between the better seasons and the outright bad ones. But I rate it that way because they did a lot wrong, but only because it was the first of even trying to do this type of adaptation. They made a lot of mistakes. They didn't repeat after that. And it was very much a learning experience for the entire staff on that. So I can give it in some, I can give it a lot of slack and still really enjoy it overall when going back to watch it. But compared to what they did a lot of the time later, it doesn't really rate that highly, even in comparison to the later seasons of MMPR, which I in fact rate higher. If I'd rate all three seasons together, I'd rate it more around a 4.5 or a straight 5. Okay. I'm, I'm with uh, Davis on that. I kind of rate MMPR all three seasons as kind of middle of the road. But I definitely have to say the first season is definitely the weakest because of how they're, you know, because of how they were getting their footing and learning what to do. Yeah. I think the second and third seasons were stronger only because they started letting the villains win instead of the first season where uh, the heroes kept winning, but the villains never won ever. In the second and third season, the villains actually started to win, so uh, things storylines started getting a lot more interesting. Yeah. Um, to clarify my point, it's only season one that I rated three. I rate season two and season three of uh, four and five, respectively. Sure, that's fine. Personally, when it comes to Power Rangers, uh, I, I do agree that MMPR, while it is the more memorable, it's the weak link because it is the most episodic. Um, as season two and three uh, went on, it became less episodic. And while it was still Monster of the Week type of show, uh, they, be they got more full storylines as time went on, uh, especially with the introduction of the Green Ranger and the stuff like yeah. that. Um, yes. Tommy Jesus Oliver. Yeah, yeah. The the popularity of Tommy is huge. Uh, the the thing that I like about it is that over time, especially during uh, the stuff with Zed, they really got an establishment for what they wanted to do with the show, and it got darker. It, it the plans got better, and and honestly, Rita is not the best villain in Power Rangers, um, but I, I like Zed, and when Zed was brought into the show, I thought it was it was better. So as a whole, Mighty Morphin um, was fun, uh, experimental, and flawed, but it was the 90s. Yeah. yeah. We cannot deny about how awesome the theme song is, right? right. No, Ron Wasman's work is glorious. Yes. He, how he's blood amazing. That's hell. Yeah, but, it, you know, it's actually interesting about how um, relevant that this particular Power Rangers is. Uh, this one is the one that got the most recent movie adaptation, the one that came out last year. And also, I think there's even a comic book series off of it now, right, Jim? Because I, well, I remember that you were tweeting yeah. about it. Yeah, there are multiple comic book series. There's one based, there's uh, two based on the original series and one based on the movie. Oh, that's right, the movie. Oh, I completely forgot about that. So, but yeah, I know, uh, but we still need to talk about it. So, yeah, let's quickly discuss about the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers movie because I remember when uh, this movie came out on VHS, I remember that my cousins used to watch it all the time because they were huge Power Rangers fans. And I saw it and I just thought it was like really weird. Like, you have this. Um, alien by the name of Ivan Ooze who just landed on Earth and he's trying to cover the whole entire world with like this purple goo and I just thought it was weird and you know the, uh, and the intro oh go ahead that's not exactly the plot he was sealed on uh, in the planet and a bunch of people uh, digging out or con doing construction work um, 
dug it out and pretty much released him. And then the enslavement by his ooze was to repower two robots of his, which were, I don't even know what they were for. They were, I think the, the storyline for that kind of fell apart. Rule yeah. the universe, conquer the planet, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I, I always felt that it was kind of weird. I, and the fact that the, the, in, the introduction, the, the, the movie starts off with them skydiving. Skydiving to the Red Hot Chili Peppers. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I think because that the writers for that movie were like the writers for the Street Fighter movie. Halfway through, they just went, okay, there's no way we're going to be able to make this into a serious uh, movie that anybody will take at all seriously. So let's just see how much fun we can have with this and how much we can laugh at this. Yeah, like, it, and Arnie Olsen, neither of whom were regular writers for the series, and I have no other IMDb data on them. From what I can gather, the people who wrote the movie didn't really have a lot to do with the show. I mean, they wanted to uh, give the people who had secret identities uh, open face visors and all this other stuff. Like, this was a mess of a production, and I'm pretty sure the skydiving was just to give the cast a vacation. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. And um, I guess for the most part, yeah, the movie doesn't exactly, like, really, you know, give a good story towards the Power Rangers. And also, if you're not familiar with the Power Rangers and you watch this movie as your introduction point, I think it will just make make even less sense. Yeah, I mean, someone could step in. They probably have heard the stuff about season one, but this movie is, like, set in an alternate timeline between season two and they'll watch it and they think wait someone told me that the yellow ranger was an asian woman now it's a black woman what gives yeah oh yeah there was a cast change because saban doesn't pay actors a livable wage and are non-union and all that in fact that still holds to this day yeah I met Austin St. John in a convention about a few years ago and nowadays he's actually a firefighter which is pretty awesome. We yeah, he was, he was actually really nice. He was a nice guy when I met him. And I also met, well, um, let's see, who else did I meet? Oh, yeah, and I also met up with Dave and Yost, and um, I met up with Walter Jones, and they were also really cool, too. Yeah. And Walt Dan Jones Rimble. would later on go on to do Space Cases shortly after he left Power Rangers. Terrible thing would happen to David Yost. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, the treatment he got was bullshit, but I'm glad that he's been vindicated, and he's still, in my opinion, the best actor. Well, not the best actor from the show, but he portrayed the best ranger from the show. He kind of did, uh, yeah. I, I was able to meet him at a con once, and he says he's in a much better place these days, so we can be thankful for that, at least. Yeah, that's good. I I mean, it, it is really terrible what happened, but he left the show on his own terms, and <laughs> the showrunners made the stupidest decision when they, uh, yeah. well, in a lot of it, but just the way they tried to quickly replace him and throw it under the rug, it just, it, for those who don't know, David Yost is very gay, and he was pretty much uh toward like bullied on set it, it it was not a very fun time for people of the lgbt community at that time um and he walked off set so we should clarify for those who haven't heard of this it was not by any of his other cast members but like other members of the production staff the crew not the cast yeah and yeah. some people said one of the producers, but there's never been any confirmation of who it was, only suspicion by who tried to refute his statements. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and as for the Yellow Ranger, uh, sadly, she passed away in a car accident a few years after she left the series. Mm -hmm. That's one. Yeah, there, were, uh, there was an episode of Time Force uh, dedicated to, his, to her memory. That's, yeah. Yeah. So, um, moving on, uh, I, the one thing that I want to briefly discuss about right before um, we go over to the second series is, um, have any of you guys ever played the, the video games of Mighty Morphin Power Rangers? Because I played the Super Nintendo beat-em-up when I was a kid. Oh, I my did. I still, yeah, same here. I still own the Genesis version of the original game, and I played with my friends at the time the movie version. We had a lot of time, spent a lot of time doing the movie uh, one on the Genesis I really enjoyed the game. Like, I would play it a lot when I was a kid, but as I got slightly older, I realized it's a very short game. Um, and, and to be fair, I think it was good that it wasn't quite as hard as a lot of the other beat-em-ups back in the day. Um, but I, I, I 
while I still enjoy it, while there's a lot of replay value with the different characters, um, there's not too many stages. I really wish there was more bosses and stuff, but it was it was a lot of fun. Um, especially, I think they, sorry, I think they got uh, the difficulty uh, wrong for most of the Super Nintendo, uh, the 16-bit era games. Like um, the original Mighty Morphin game was really really easy, even when I was in grade school. But the movie game was really hard. Oh yeah, the the movie game just I I don't know what they were thinking with that one. Um, Genesis we're like, version. We're like apparently, the Genesis version was here. easier. Um, I I like that they included the uh the 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 uh, Zord fights and the Mega Zord and like they they did a lot of good things to to allow people to get in and play the game. But I feel like there just wasn't enough looking back like if, if you played it back in the day yeah there was enough but if you play it nowadays like i could beat it in an afternoon well that's pretty much how it was the norm for licensed games back in the 90s yeah yeah i mean let's yeah. be honest i mean how many licensed games nowadays are actually at more at least competent no i mean it, uh i if you look at anything platinum games does like they've done a few licensed games and they've been pretty damn good so well, yeah, Platinum yeah. Games has a consistent level of quality to them. Uh, most licensed games are little more than shovelware tying into yeah. another product. Yeah, uh, yeah. There are some standouts. Yeah, There are some standouts, but it tends to be the norm. Yeah, but I mean, like, Platinum Games, Telltale Games, and some of the LEGO games, they're, like, the only ones that really stand out as being... Batman good Arkham? Oh, good point. And uh, the I upcoming that, Spider-Man like, game... Like, that's like the exception, though. Almost every Batman game before that has been ass. Yeah, we don't talk about the the, the Batman Forever game on the Genesis. Yeah, have you ever so played it's... Batman Dark Tomorrow? Was that the one with no. the like, voice cast from the oh, series? Oh, God. Right? So that we... was, I forgot who voiced it, but it was the one um, that released for the PS2 and GameCube and Xbox. It was an unplayable mess. Oh, yeah. So, can you surprised that it's gotten better the last few years, but in the 90s it was terrible? Yeah. Well, actually, to, to, to be perfectly honest, there was a lot of really great licensed games at the SNES. If you look at Disney's library with, like, Chip and Dale, Goof Troop, uh, DuckTales, Aladdin. It's just, it, Aladdin. Um, but the thing is, they were all very specific type games that either were very hard or very short. Yeah. Or they had creative involvement from Disney, which is usually where licensed games don't suck. Yeah, yeah. so it, it's it's one of those things where back in those days we were spoiled, but if you look anywhere else, they were bad. Yeah. yeah. All right, I guess we can go over to the next one. So the next one, uh, what was it, like Alien Rangers or was it Zeo? Zeo. Uh, Zeo. Alien Rangers, well, was Alien a- Rangers came in first, but that was part of the third season. Yeah, yeah it, it was. was a- yeah, okay. Any series. Part of the third season using the same stock footage that was that the third season used overall. It's not really its own separate thing. It's inclusive to that. Okay, so yeah, next one is Zio. So yeah, please give your thoughts on it because I haven't. Seen oh it. God, I loved Zio because it, it would, in my opinion, when I watched it when I was a kid, it improved on everything that I loved about Power Rangers. Oh Thank hell yeah. You. Almost everything right that season, especially in comparison to what they had to work with. Its source material got heavily screwed over due to a terrorist attack because it was originally meant to be a more war-themed series. And they basically just had were left with very silly situations that they could do with what it with what they had, and it didn't work very well. Zio, yeah, that happens to Super Sentai a lot. Yeah, but no more than O Ranger, which was the name of Zio's adaptation. But Zio was able to take all of that potential that was there, and I believe used it to the best in the best ways they possibly could. They um, made almost everybody take a level in badass that season. Everybody had a story to them. Uh, yeah. Less so, Billy, really due to David Yost leaving the series, but there was a lot of. There was a lot of character shuffling, and it wasn't just the Tommy Show plus guest starring the Power Rangers. Yeah, yeah they, 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 they really, really st- they really stepped up their game this season for giving like multiple plot threads, and this was the point where it really became less a monster of the week and a plot running show. 
Uh, the the big thing that I had a problem with though is I never really liked the Machine Empire as villains. They didn't really have the same thing as as Zed. Zed had this menace, and even when he was losing, like you got the sense that he was still uh, a, a force to be reckoned with. I never really got that with the Machine Empire, but other than that, this this really did step up the game. To be I, fair, at the end of the second and third season, Zed ended up becoming like the hempecked husband, and you just started seeing him as a joke anyway. And yet, Although, he, when he, he was he collaborating did. with Rita, he actually had the more effective strategies. One, yeah. could, one could support doing the long-term plans that would allow them to win, while the other was a lot more focused on the day-to-day -day pestering the Rangers. Yeah. So they worked better as a team than a solo. Yeah. I would agree with that. Yeah. I, I would I would honestly credit the, the most... Um, quality improvement to season three and zeo due to um the pro producer and showrunner douglas sloan who came on at that point and pretty much moved them into more serialized storytelling hmm. and i think ron wasserman did, outdid himself for the opening thing because when i first watched it, i'm all like oh yeah this is this is getting good stronger than before in fact, the ben. song was so awesome that even the dog likes it. Yeah, sorry, neighbor's dog. That's okay. <laughs> yeah, that theme song was badass. Like, I, I don't think anything really beats the original, but this felt like a continuation of the original, and it was badass, and it was a lot of fun. Um, Electric guitars take ev make everything take a level and awesome. I miss when we had power ballads like that. Yeah, yeah that, that rock opera stuff was really amazing back in the day. Yeah, they try to do the same thing again when I was watching Megaforce, in which they had like the, the like the guitar and instrumental themes, but I just it, I felt like it wasn't the same. Oh it's god, because the Rangers kept introducing themselves over the damn guitar. Yeah, yeah. and the and the actual composer for every Neo Saban season is absolutely terrible. Um, I have hearing issues and. Um, Noam Keneal's music for Samurai Onwards makes me feel physical pain to the point I need to put in earplugs to even watch anything. Yeah. Not like if I submitted a YouTube video of those remixes, I would be locked up for YouTube crimes. Yeah. Well, let's get away from the from the negatives for now. Keep focusing on the good. Zio, as yes. I said, did a lot of good stuff. Uh, a lot of good character progression. Rocky had moved from being a joke to actually having uh, greater character depth. Catherine showed that she wasn't just a Kimberly clone. Um, by the way, haters, get over the fact that Cat, that Cat and Tommy got together. <laughs> yeah. No, cool. and there was a lot more focus on my favorite Ranger character of all time, Adam. Yes. Never cease to show the case the awesome of Johnny on Bosch. Yeah. Yep. Anyway, so yeah, I guess that we can. Well, before we move on to Turbo, we need to discuss about the movie because I believe that the movie was supposed to be like the transition between Zio and Turbo, if I remember. Yeah, it is. It is canon. It is the yeah. only canon movie. Yeah. We don't so really talk I, about I remember that when I here. yeah when I first saw the movie, um, I thought yeah because I haven't seen Power Rangers, I didn't see Zio, and so then when they were talking about oh here comes the second Power Rangers movie, I was like oh I haven't seen Power Rangers in a very long time, because after the first series I pretty much stopped, so I decided okay you know what I'll watch it because my cousins were still into Power Rangers, so I was watching it and. It, it was okay. I mean, I, I like the, you know, some of the new Rangers. I just never liked the kid who played the Blue Ranger. I don't know, just something about him just kind of irked me a little bit. And the I just, idea of having one. a kid as a, as a Power Ranger was kind of stupid, in my opinion. I mean, I never watched uh, Big Bad Beetleborgs as a kid, but I always thought the idea of having a kid who transforms into an adult to fit in the costume was stupid since you got to have like the strength to wield that power yeah and and for for those who are wondering no this is not sh supposed to be like a reference to shazam um it in part was a reference to super sentai um the footage they got for my more power Rangers season two was from the series die ranger the sixth ranger of that series was a kid because the producer of that specific series is an idiot. Um, it's, it's a kid who used his powers to, like, you know, um, flip up little girls' skirts. 
Yeah, yeah, he was a total pervert and pretty much hated by the audience, but he ironically also had the strongest story arc for that series. So basically that's where the idea is seated and comes from in that TV show executives think to get back a waning audience, maybe you should bring in one of the waning audience to the show. And Justin himself was not the problem. It's just that he basically had the Wesley Crusher thing happen where he suddenly is as good or sees things that the veteran rangers do not and i mean that... he was supposed to be like a prodigy and um i think that kind of made him a gary stew for a lot of people he got better as time went on especially when the the team change in the middle of the series in the first third of the series finished as you know then he was a bit more balanced with everybody but early on with it felt like everybody else was turned into an idiot to glorify his inclusion, and that was not good for selling the audience on the character. So he's un- he was essentially just, so he was essentially like Scrappy Doo and like the earlier Scooby Doo incarnations. Yeah, I just don't like the way he was introduced. Like the movie did not change over the cast in any ceremonious manner. Um, the way they just did not. The the zero powers transfer was was not handled correctly. The fact that Justin just uh, not uh, not Justin Rocky just breaks his leg or something, and then all of a sudden we call on a kid. Like just the handling of the transition of power was just so poorly done that I really uh, just I had a sour taste for the rest of the season. This is in part due to a changeover in um, contr- who had control over the series, too. The new showrunner beating with uh, Turbo was Jonathan Zacker, who this is fun say. How have little positive to say about him, in part due to this. And pretty much he t- had the idea of taking things back to the way they were in My Morphin when the people who were watching the show had developed along with the show so they didn't want to go back to that new people weren't interested because it still had a continuity and trying to fit the middle ground of that didn't work because they didn't transit properly transition any of it so there's this big gaping hole of a continuity break between zeo and turbo where they're the same characters are involved but nothing quite fits it, it, it felt really, really off, and it's like, I, as much as I like the concept of a legacy show, and I wish they kept the continuity, the best decision was later to uh, have each individual season be standalone, because you don't get problems like this if people don't care. Well, even then, there was a, usually a crossover episode that bridged them to say, yeah, they're in the same universe, but we're leaving you alone to do your own thing. The continuity matters, but we're not going to actively apply it unless you invoke it. In, and, in and most I, of the season, some of them don't have them, unfortunately, but like that that's why I like stuff like the uh, Dino Thunder episode that, yeah, it was a clip show, but it referenced every single series before it, and it was a great jumping on point if you've never seen any of these series. It explained most of what happened. And it did it respectfully, which is what we can't say about Samurai, but we will get to that. I think the issue with the writer was that, and it doesn't really matter if it's a legacy show or a show where every season starts brand new, because um, Chakor was also responsible for Super Mega Force, which was its own season, and that still turned out really poorly. We'll get to that. There's a a whole tied-in thing to that where he's very revisionist history, but that is neither here nor there for the time being. Uh, I think the one thing that I want to say right before we move on to Power Rangers in space is that I remember when I watched the movie and I thought that, oh, you know, they have like these new animals and it's really cool. And then when Adam gets the frog and, you know, he's like, oh, why do I have the frog? And then the the woman who gives him the powers is like, oh, so you can, you know, it's like a frog, you know, turn into a handsome prince. And I thought that that was just really lame. But then I saw Gaijin Gooba's yeah. video about like how out of all the animals featured in and they're supposed to be ninjas and the frog frog actually makes the most sense and everything else is just absolutely ridiculous so and also they had um johnny young bosch as a guest so i thought that was actually pretty cool yeah it was a good line 
So, uh, yeah, basically, if, uh, for those who, are, uh, who don't know about, you know, the frog and the ninja thing, it's basically, bas uh, it's basically a reference to the, the tale of the Galan Jiraiya. Uh, for those who are, are Naruto fans, you probably already know about that particular reference. Yeah, most of the season three stuff, including the movie, was based off a series that was uh, referencing all of that kind of Japanese uh, historical fantasy lore about ninja. The, the White Ranger was from a clan of ninja. The Red Ranger, that was based on Sarutobi Sasuke, who was uh, the basis for Sarutobi Haruzi in Naruto. The, the list goes on on that. Yeah. So yeah, I I, I did an I did, already did a Naruto and Naruto Shibuden podcast a while ago, so you can go listen to those if you're interested. But let, let's move over to Power Rangers in Space, and this is where I, I did hear about Power Rangers in Space. I think this is about around the point in which my cousins were already getting too old and they were lo losing interest. It's like, oh man, Power Rangers in Space. That sounds like a stupid idea. And then I heard like there was rumblings about like the Power Rangers meeting up with the Ninja Turtles, and then I was like, "Oh man, it's like the series has gone absolutely ridiculous." And I think that was when to I pretty this much day, just... oh, go ahead. How to this day the Ninja Turtles crossover is in the top twenty, I believe, potentially top thirty worst episodes of Power Rangers. So if you're thinking from concept it was stupid it actually was stupid uh, it, it, it couldn't be worse than the evil pizzas were no match for a simple stoplight <laughs> the ninja turtles the ninja, the ninja turtles out of nowhere are brainwashed by the bad guy of the season Aspanama, has should have no idea how she know she knows of them and six them on the power rangers they then proceed to take over the ship with no fight at all yeah, and it's all undone by them passing through a nebula, which shouldn't even have done what it did to undo the brainwashing. But I mean, out of context, it's really out of left field. It was just like one of those weird um, crossover events that they had back when um, Ninja Turtles: The Next Mutation and Power Rangers was airing. It's kind of like if you watched. Um, a season of Arrow or The Flash, like years into the future, and you don't watch any of the other series, you're going to be asking, wait, why are all these other characters showing up, and why am I starting in the middle of one of these uh, crossover events? It's it's just one of those things that you have to watch in context. So, yeah, context I always thought stupid. that episode always, to me, felt like a troll move from Saban, because I know that people pan next mutation, so I oh, guess Hank yeah. was thinking... Yeah, so I guess Hank Saban was thinking, oh, they don't like this show, fine, I'll cram it in my... Another one, Judd, right yeah. that puts the Ninja Turtles in. I was actually about to mention that. It was intended as cross-promotion for Next Mutation, which pretty much everybody hated from the outset, and it did not do in space any favors since basically before the series, Saban was saying, yeah, this is going to be the last series, we're going to cancel it, doesn't matter what we do. And of course, the writing staff, now headed by Judd Lynn, who was the only competent, really the only competent writer after the previous writing staff left during Turbo, left to really salvage the show. So ironically, he said in your interview that that was one of his favorite episodes to write, so there's no accounting for taste there. Mm. Yeah. I, don't, I, I, I mean, I, I don't remember really fun to write, it, so... It, it, it can be really fun to write, but still be bad. I mean, I have fun watching a lot of, like, really bad movies and TV shows and anime, but they're still bad. Yeah, yeah, I think there is there is accounting for like something like say Birdemic or The Room or like things that are bad and you can acknowledge them. And at least it was entertainingly bad and not in the sense of uh, th there are certain things that I have had to watch uh, that I'm working on right now that uh, is just a slog to get through and a slog to make a review about. So it's it's bad, but not in the sense that I would pan it too much, honestly. Um, and in overall, in space, to to me is is my favorite season, uh, simply because that it does a lot of things. I loved the the morphers and the morphing sequence. I loved the villains. I thought the villains were for very well handled. I thought the stakes were there, and they they kept getting better weaponry in this fight, and you get to see the the. Uh, power of the evil forces because everything from every previous season is here yeah. and the final battle uh, obviously countdown to destruction is one of the best episodes of power rangers ever and they still shortchanged it it could have been a lot better but they hamstrung it by that director and it being cut down episodes 
Yeah, still, they, still, they still made it work with what they had, though. I like in I space think, because... I, sorry. I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I was just saying, this was the first season that really started exploring the more complex themes. You know, things like nature versus nurture. What is the true nature of evil? Can people be redeemed? And, you know, it was... Um, it took them a long time to get to this level, but they definitely... I'd say for the most part, they nailed it. Astronema is a very complex character. I think she's one of the top five best uh, villains of this franchise. When people yeah. ask me to um, like just sum up Power Rangers in space, I just call it, it's, it's Crisis on Infinite Rangers. <laughs> <laughs> Good way to put it. But yeah, Astronema was I, really... I really thought it was basically good. Spartacus. Yeah, yeah, where everyone's yeah. saying they're a ranger to yeah. throw the pills on. Ah. I guess there's not really much to say on that, so why don't we move over to the next one? Let's move over to Lost Galaxy. Okay, Lost, so Galaxy, Lost was... Galaxy Lost Galaxy was started off uh, clearly just riding the coattails of in space, because Ginga Man didn't have much of a space theme. Aside but, from its name actually, actually translating as Galaxy Man, but right. it actually yeah. had nothing um, to It do. had more of a nature theme, though, actually, I think. It um, was. The, the team were the protectors of the Ginga Forest, uh, which right. had all of these... was the home for all of these star beasts, and it had been a bunch of pirates trying to come after the powers hidden in that forest, and basically that forms the uh, structure of the series. Damn right. pirates. Why can't they just leave us alone? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I mean, clearly it, it started off as just like a, okay, so In Space uh, got a lot of ratings, so let's just make something similar to In Space, and I'm sure we'll get the same ratings. Um, but as it went on, like I think when the Magna Defenders started coming on, then it, it started get, developing its own identity and got, uh, pretty, uh, it got better. Oh, yeah. There's a My good video. understanding of that was from the initial details they were given about the series, they had a whole different idea of what it was going to be about. Whereas In Space had the advantage of um, all of the spaceships from In Space's uh, source material, Mega Ranger, being you know spaceships and having all that tech device theming where they could easily make it a series about being in space. With Ginga Man, they thought it was going to be a series about space, but it turned out to not be, and they'd already dedicated all those resources to doing it, so might as well follow through. Yeah. And again, they were also working on expanding the concepts, too. I mean, Lost Galaxy, for as inconsistent as it could be, it dealt with a lot. I mean, in the premiere episodes, what happened? Maya loses her entire planet. Uh, Leo Corbett loses his brother Mike, who sacrifices himself to let him and the others escape. So now Leo has to live with this pressure of basically taking on a mantle that wasn't meant for him. Which was a Sentai storyline adaptation, actually. So right. was the, the so was everything with the Magna Defender. Yeah, only except they changed it so that wasn't it in the Sentai? It was Magna Defender's brother that got killed, but in the, no, it was Gal after his son there too. Oh, okay, yeah. You have more. You also have again complex villains. You know, you have Villamax, who actually has a sense of nobility and loyalty, and you have Drakina, who's torn between wanting to be free spirited and expected to live up to her father's wishes. She has the best character arc among all the villains, too. And and and, they, and of course, they bring. There is the big moment where Kendrix sacrifices herself to stop the re-emerged re Psycho Pink, and then Corone comes in and earns her redemption in a way, which makes her a much better redeemed Ranger than Tommy ever was. Sorry, JDF fans. Not wrong. No. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I guess um, for the most part, um, it does sound like it's a pretty decent series overall. So uh, I guess we can move on to the next one, uh, which is um, Lightspeed Rescue. Lightspeed Rescue was a very back to basic series. Again, from the Sentai material they had where the heroes were all a family of rescue workers. Sadly, that's kind of the biggest thing lost in the adaptation because Lightspeed is more of a direct adaptation than of uh, Sentai material to Power Rangers form than prior years because the villains in the Sentai source material were all family members as well. So you have that contrasting perspectives of two families in conflict over uh, just these various um, aspects of story points. Whereas in Lightspeed, you had 
the mentor figure with his two kids being rangers and then not much else to carry that idea. Anybody Lightspeed else Rescue is a... Go ahead. Sorry. No, no. Uh, Lightspeed Rescue is one of those seasons where most of the... I, I, don't, I haven't seen anybody who is a huge fan of that season. Most, most of the time when people ask about that season, it's like, uh-huh, yeah, that's the season between Lost Galaxy and Time Force. My roommate Matt is a huge fan. He actually uh, went and bought out one of the toys when he found it for cheap recently. Hmm. Well, that's the first I've heard of that, so congrats on finding a unicorn. I guess you could say that it's pretty much like middle of the road, very similar to the original. And yeah. I mean, I wouldn't put it that way. I find the villains extremely boring. I found the yeah. the concept very bad. The Rangers themselves are great, and and as I rewatched later on, I did like a little, a little bit more. But honestly, this feels like a step back after In Space and 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 Lost Galaxy. I yeah, just it, describe it as inoffensive, but nothing groundbreaking. It's very mixed bag. I mean, you have some good moments. You have the bit with the Titanium Ranger and how he turns out to be uh, Captain Mitchell's lost son, Ryan. And then you have the conflicts between him and Dana trying to get him back on his side. You have the badass meme machine that is Carter Grayson. But then you have all these really dumb moments. Like, Chad, the Blue Ranger, he never had a good episode. There was an episode where his former, I guess, martial arts mentor comes in and says that he's disappointed that Chad became a ranger instead of continuing his studies. Like, dude, the guy is saving lives. How can you be disappointed in that? It was dumber in the Sentai adaptation. Ironically, Lightspeed Rescue suffers many, due to it being so heavily based on the Sentai than previous yeah. series, you can kind of see the same failings in a lot of them, even though Lightspeed tries to mediate them some more, but just never achieves that, outstand, that, that measure of outstanding to differentiate from those. Oh, yeah. right. Speaking of that, um, Titanium Ranger, first American-only Ranger. Yep. Titanium? Emma. I mean, that's... I mean, I, 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 what is this, like, um, you know how in the, the 2000s, like, when they were, like, you know, during the millennial, uh, the millennium age, in which it's like, oh, you have the titanium superhero that looks in this color and stuff like that. Was, was that kind of like a reference to it? No, it's like they were trying to not call him the Silver Ranger again. A thing with a lot of the Six Ranger is they have to have this distinguishing measure between them. Like the original Green Ranger was originally called the Dragon Ranger, even though it, the rest of his team was based off of ancient animals. Oh. You just, have, you just have to have that measure distinguishing them from everybody else to note them as part of the team, but a special member of it. Because they have the different morpher, probably the, the ones that are untested or that are, you know, that, that are not capable of being wielded by everyone. Um, for example, in later seasons, you're going to have the Quantum Ranger. Like these things that they want to make sure that this is special and this is the Ranger you want to be. Ironically, though, in the Sentai, um, there's a bit, a bit more of an emphasis on teamwork and the value of a team so what they often do with six rangers over there is introduce them as by default stronger than everybody but then over time as the main team gets stronger if they're not if they're not involving themselves as part of the main team they eventually get outclassed and surpassed this actually happened with um several of the series where um in power rangers they're more special and empowered than the others Mm. It, it, is that the reason why, like, a lot of times when uh, an evil character becomes a good character in Japanese uh, series, they kind of lose more personality because they're more with the team? Because, like, they did that with Digimon a lot, where they, you know, you had the Six Ranger who used to be evil and now is good, and all of a sudden there's no personality. Sometimes that is a problem where they just fall into the background, yeah. It's a recurring issue with some Japanese series that do that. Yeah, they, they try to rip off that Dragon Ball Z storyline way too much. Mm -hmm. This is another positive about Lightspeed Rescue, kind of for the spoiler warning. This is the first time you actually see one of the Rangers basically kick the main villain straight into hell, and it's pretty fun to see. Mm. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Especially since, you know, I'm, I'm, I haven't heard of, like, a reference to hell in the Power Rangers, so that's pretty... Well, they don't, they don't, they don't call it hell, they give it, like, some, some other name, like... The it's Shadow a, Realm! <laughs> yeah. yeah, or the... No, not the Abyss of Evil, that's Ninja Storm, but it's just, like, some place where all the dead monsters go. Okay. Alright, I guess now we can discuss about Time Force. Best season! 
Okay, so th- thank you so much for listening, everybody. Tune in next. <laughs> okay, I'm kidding. Go ahead. <laughs> so Time Force was really good, and I think that's partially because they just took Time Ranger and transferred the story over to English without much change. Basically, all they did was cut out the pretentiousness and unfortunately a few characters and mixed around a few story points, but it all worked with with how Time Force executed it. And they gave us two great waifus in Jen and Katie. Yeah, they really shaved the fat for the Time Ranger storyline. Yeah, and I think this was supposed to, from what I read a long time ago, like, this was supposed to be like the last of it because I know that Saban Entertainment was going out of business. No, it was. Wild Force was Wild actually Force. considered the Wild. last. Time Force was still fully approved. Wild Force went into production before the Saban Disney deal took place or was finalized or went through. Oh, okay. Gotcha. So part of the reason Time Time Force was so good was because of the acting ability, because many of the cast members actually had acting chops and roles before yeah. Power Rangers. Yeah. So they were able to give a much more, you know, spirited and genuine performance for the show. Biggest show stealer, of course, being Vernon Wells as Rancic. Vernon Wells previously being from Mad Max 2, Bennett and Commando, and if I'm remembering correctly, the original Predator. Hmm, maybe. Yeah. And I mean, it's just so impressive because I never even knew about his acting, uh, his acting resume until after Time Force, and I'm just, I'm impressed that I got him, and I'm impressed that he put in so much effort for what other actors would consider just a kid's show, because you really feel his rage and his pathos and his love for Nadira. And from what I've heard, Vernon Wells actually really enjoyed playing the character, so there's that too. I just, like, I just love the idea of Time Force. After Lightspeed Rescue, which I still think is a bad concept for the series. Like, don't get me wrong, getting kids to want to be on rescue teams is fine. But, you know, it it was, I always consider it the lame one when I was a kid because their vehicles were like rescue vehicles and it, it just doesn't sound cool. But first of all, Time Force concept of, going through time and stopping crimes uh the idea that you know there's alternate different timelines for each of these events um there's a lot of interesting ideas at play here i loved the characters um i love the idea of quantum ranger i loved what they did with the season and the villains are great yeah rancic does have some problems like looking back he's not the perfect villain i used to think he was but in general i think this series is uh one of the bright spots it is genuinely smart and well crafted and um it it probably has better writing then in space it just i i think in space is one of my favorites simply of the time i watched it so if you watch this show um better writing better development and overall just a lot more fun to some of uh, the characters lucas and katie the blue and yellow rangers seem a bit flat in comparison to the others this is in part because while a lot of the series is sentai adaptation the the related storylines for those characters well kind of got lost in the mix. Lucas's counterpart actually has Rancic's storyline about being having this um, infection and disease, and Katie's counterpart was male, dated this reporter woman who was a supporting character in the Sentai, and they ended up having a kid in the, uh, later on. And that was actually a tie back to in a later series that uh, attributed this, uh, the, that Sentai series. So they didn't have as much to work with with those characters, and yet they still tried to establish them and do interesting things with them. Case in point, Lucas actually going out on dates with Rancic's daughter, Nadira. Yeah, and Katie being one of the few who actually cons- contemplated the effects of changing the timeline and what that could do when they got back to the year 3000. Not bad for Power Rangers Time Cop. No, I know some people were disappointed because they thought it would be the Rangers traveling to different time periods to stop Rancic and his gang, but I was happy with what we got. And they did try and travel more than their source material did, so there's that in that they at least tried to pay lip service to the actual title of their series. Yeah. Yeah, all right. Um, So overall, would you guys consider um, Time Force to be the best one? I'd rank it five. Okay. 
there is some debate for other series to in admission. Okay. Yeah. Sure. So basically, like one of the best, like top five around that range. Probably, yeah. Okay, then I'll definitely have to check it out. All right, so let's go over to Wild Force next. Meh. Meh. Okay. Yeah. Next. <laughs> it's it's um after Time Force, uh, Wild Force is just kind of you know it's it's adequate, but after Time Force, adequate just doesn't really cut it. Judd Lynn, who wrote most a uh, fair chunk of. Like I said, it's uh, late end turbo in space, Lost Galaxy, uh, Lightspeed Rescue, and Time Force. He left at this point, so you basically had new writers and second string writers. And Jonathan, this was the first time since Turbo, Jonathan Zacher had actual creative control of the series, and they tried to, like the last two, more directly adapt the Sentai. And in the Sentai Gal Ranger. It's better than this was, unfortunately. It wasn't exactly the most outstanding of series. It worked pretty decently, but it kind of, the best moments of Wild Force were ended up being completely original stuff and the team ups. Oh yeah, definitely. If there's one few, if there's one good shining, if there are two good shining points about Wild Force. It's the team ups and it's Master Org, who is again one of the best villains the series has ever seen. I I well, I do acknowledge that there are problems. I think this is a great season. Not not nearly as good as some of the previous ones, but I like the main characters so much. Like the other Rangers, I I could take or leave, but the Red Ranger in this season is fantastic. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, during this, we also got Forever Red. Masterwork is a fantastic character. The villains are great. Um, the environmental message is what really holds it back, though. Yeah. I do. I kind of disagree with you on the Red Ranger, though, mainly because I'm one of those people who has trouble separating the art from the artist, and it's hard to watch that scene now, knowing what Ricardo Medina did. Yeah, um, Ricardo Medina, uh, Cole, the Red Ranger's actor, ended up killing his roommates and with manslaughter charges. There's been different accounts of what happened, and I don't think the transcript for the actual court case was made public i think he pled out yeah and he, ki- he killed his roommate with a samurai sword from what i understand which is um unfortunate considering his later role in power rangers yeah that's what they call on tv tropes harsher in hindsight yeah in uh, i mean i i didn't personally know any of those details i just judge what I see on screen, and yeah, it can be hard sometimes. But I, it's just speaking from the like of the character. When I was a kid watching this, he drew me into that that first episode. And out of the Rangers, he alone really stuck with me. Yeah. Well, like I said, it's uh, all personal perspective. I'm glad you can still enjoy it. Speaking of uh, the Red Rangers, though, I was. Um, I was out of Power Rangers for a while at this point, but um, Forever Red was an episode that was airing while, when I had the TV on. It was turned to Power Rangers. I'm all like, oh, wow, this is awesome because Red Rangers, everybody loves Red Rangers. You know, I just it, it's just a shame that they weren't able to make it a two parter like they wanted. To. Yeah, Disney got control of the franchise in mid production of the series, and they didn't understand the idea of a 10th anniversary team up special, especially with the crossover earlier in the season. So, harsher in hindsight, especially considering how many legacy franchises they have hold of right now. On the bright side, that was one of the really outstanding moments by director Koichi Sakamoto, who is sadly um, villainized by the Power Rangers fandom because they don't know actually understand what he did for directing work for the franchise. And a lot of the stunt work that was seen there that wasn't previously seen in Power Rangers, he's integrated into his stunt work for later choreography, late, um, later on that he's done for Toei, Superaya, and a few other companies. Um, case in point, he was the head director for the Sentai series Kyoujer, which was the source material for Dino Charge. And sadly, Dino Charge did not use his stunt choreography well at all. Mm, that's an understatement. Yeah, we'll, we'll discuss about that later on. Yeah. So overall, from what I've been hearing, Wild Force is a step back from Time Force, but there are some good things about it. It's kind of like an ups and downs thing. Um, 
Lost Galaxy doesn't is good, but doesn't compare well in comparison to in, in space, but is otherwise decent. Uh, Lightspeed Rescue stepped down from uh, Lost Galaxy, still not bad. Then you get the jump from Time Force, and then you get the the slump again in Wild Force. And again, it's more that sometimes Power Rangers it's best when it's dissociating itself from the Sentai. They just need to know what to use when. Mm-hmm. It, it's it's the way I like to see it is you get really good seasons and then uh, okay season and then a season that's not so great and then it goes up again because like I think Ninja Storm is a good season overall um, and and better better than Wild Force in my opinion just because of the stuff that it does but the villains kind of suck and then you get the stuff later on with Dino Thunder which is a step up. Yeah, I guess we can move on to Ninja Storm now. Ninja Storm was the first fully Disney-driven one, and it was all uh, they lost a lot of stuff because they thought they were canceling the franchise after Wild Force again, but and then they decided to move uh, production to New Zealand so things would be cheaper. And this is where Douglas Sloan, who, as I said, did seasons three and Zio, came back to be the head the showrunner for Ninja Storm and also Dino Thunder. So it was basically his interpretation of a back-to-basic series, kind of going back to the silliness of MMPR, but bring, but also keeping all of these good storytelling things from his tenure, and it also come into the series from uh, In Space through Wild Force. So it's, it's a good series. I really enjoy it. It's just that some people find it too campy for their tastes. I'm in that. I'm in that group. I could not take Ninja Storm seriously. It was hard to. To be fair, the other idea apparently that some of the writers have for like uh, having the there be like some sort of academy that Tommy was running, and then having this Power Rangers Civil War was oh, equally yeah, not hexagon. as. Yeah, that was that was not even remotely feasible. And people who say that that w- that would have been a better season uh, are dumb. Yeah, um, mainly uh, a yeah. lot of people have kind of seen that concept in play in um, Super Sentai. Again, to reference Super Sentai, doing this, they have they since 1995 they have had annual team ups with previous teams kind of the basis for how Power Rangers has done them but a lot of the time they end up having one team or the other showcased as the villain of it for a length of it and the reasoning varies sometimes they're brainwashed sometimes it's a misunderstanding sometimes they're fighting over the same goal post but generally it they've ended up being terrible when they do it because it goes against the general themes both franchises both super sentai and power rangers operate off of where it's more focused about teamwork and camaraderie and even to this season's credit they pre- they briefly had the various factions uh the various uh sorry the subsections of the full team at odds with each other and yet they got past that pr- a lot faster than the sentai did because you know it didn't make sense to have them at odds they did very well with the parts of the story where they were at odds to adapt the material they had, but it still felt wrong to have them at each other's throats as they did. The thing that really gets me about this season in particular, though, is they there there are some really, really good ideas, but it definitely feels so experimental. And again, the villain Lothor is just very very bad uh another thing is the mentor of this season is the guinea pig pig is a stupid idea yeah sentai story adaptation it was terrible there too yeah well i've seen the at least they didn't use a nightmare fuel inducing puppet i mean it's it's the same thing as like something like doggy kruger which like i can understand the idea behind it but I mean, in Japan, there was a terrible-looking uh, mask and whatnot. It's just you, there are things that may yeah. sound good in your head, but they're not good anyway. And yeah. just having the master or mentor curse to be a guinea pig for the first time in the series, where we got something this out of left field, like you couldn't have just made him a giant head in a tube. 
No, I know. Or was, Al, the, his kid is a tech expert. Why not actually have him be a digital head in a tube while his body is comatose? I mean, the villain is played by the same actor. There is no difficulty in getting him in for longer shoots instead of, like, Zordon's... All, all of the footage of Zordon in the giant floating, being the giant floating head in a tube was done in, like, a day total. Yeah. I don't, uh, yeah, I don't necessarily hate Lothar. I like Grant McFarlane as an actor, and I admit he had some good, a few good jokes and one-liners. Like, there's this one that always that people always point out. After he grows a monster, he looks at the camera and says, well, what did you expect? He wasn't going to get smaller. And they actually give a reason why Lothar, who would not actually grow all of his monsters at once, there's actually a usage limitation, which retroactively, ex- or it clarifies a point of continuity and why so many of the other faction members didn't do that as well. Just spam a bunch of giant monsters so the mechs of the series would be overwhelmed. Not only is that a stock footage thing, there's actually a reason why the various enemy factions don't actually do that. Yeah. Takes too much power. Yeah, but I mean, as much as I like him, I don't think he was really main villain material. I definitely think it should have been someone like Zergain or Vexicus or Shimasu as the main antagonist because they seemed a little more you know, menacing and intimidating. Mm-hmm. And again, that is kind of explained by the Sentai where Lothor didn't really have a counterpart. Right. I, the others did. Yeah. Okay, I think my point. favorite part of this season was Cam. Oh yeah, Cam was the only ranger I really liked. He was very snarky, very well developed, and it was enjoyable to go through his entire arc. All right, uh, I guess now we can just go over to the next one. Uh, Power Rangers SPD. No, Dino Thunder. Oh, Dino Thunder. Dino. Yes, right. Yep. So, Power Rangers Dino Thunder. So, we go from Storm to Thunder, where it sounds like a downgrade. Next thing, <laughs> next thing you know, we're going to be getting Power Rangers Super Drizzle. I mean, th- the the crossover name is called Thunderstorm, so, you know. Yeah. yeah. I, you know they were intending to do that. I Probably. think the strong suit of this is that they put one of the previous Rangers in a mentor role. And granted, it obviously had to be the one that most people knew about, like, whatever. But they, they utilized it in a very fantastic way. And the the history between Tommy Oliver and uh, the villain was great. I, I honestly really did like the villain and the dynamic of... Uh, it's kind of a Jekyll and Hyde relationship. Yeah, you can really uh, see this as the ser- the franchise going full circle as a full on legacy series, legacy entry, going back to MPR and asking, "Hey, what if they actually were teenagers with attitude?" Right. Um, and they, and know, they even I, I like the evil ranger turning good. I like that Tommy was in the season, but I, it would have been nice to see him in more than, like, ten episodes. Yeah. Yeah. Production yeah, like, limitations there. What, what I would have liked a little bit more is if they had him mentor them uh, and train them a little bit more. Because for, from what I was seeing, he was giving them advice, but he wasn't treating them like Power Rangers, if that makes sense. They can kind of see that from the whole consequences angle, considering Tommy was part of the reason why the evil villain even had his forces this season, as he was involved in their development as kind of a world peacekeeping force uh, to assist the Power Rangers, and yet they ended up becoming an enemy, and all of that tied to, like, a lot of it felt like cleaning up his mistakes and dragging, ending up dragging people into it. Yeah, that seems to be the main theme, like, accepting the, you know, facing up to the consequences of past mistakes and learning how to move forward. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, it, it, it really did uh, elevate the format in a lot of regards. I mean, it was still Monster of the Week. You still had the, the gems and whatnot that they had to get, but... Um, you still had these personal character stakes that they they get better with over time, and th- this to me is one of the better seasons. Not not quite on par with like Time Force or anything, but um, certainly better than uh, Ninja Storm. Yeah. Oh yeah. Def- I put I definitely put it in term in my top three to be honest. Top ten. I usually think 
it shuffles between four, five, and six for me. Yeah, um, actually, maybe at the end of the podcast, maybe we'll briefly discuss about what our top favorite incarnations of Power Rangers are. In case any of the listeners who are distanced from Power Rangers, like myself, will be able to find something to, you know, take a watch. Yeah. One of us, so if you are going to watch Dino Thunder, try not to get any close-up images of the monsters of the day because they are some of the freakiest looking in the sentai abba ranger their motif was they were an animal plant and inanimate object hybrid and the way they get smashed together some of them look like lovecraftian abominations so there is some nightmare nightmare fuel involved yes yeah Mm -hmm. all right now let's talk now let's go over spd special paul patrol delta Space Patrol Delta. Space Patrol, Space Patrol Delta, Delta. Yeah. Uh, There's yeah. an actual uh, thing about that. The SPD logo is actually... have the They were stuck with that from the Sentai, where each of the... The SPD is short for Special Police Decker Ranger, which is actually the name of the series. Yeah. This oh. is where Bruce Kalish, as a showrunner, came on, and he was in charge of SPD, Mystic Force, Overdrive, and Jungle Fury... And he came on with the idea that his job was to basically transcribe, not adapt the Sentai. So, basic, so the failings of and so, of many of the merits of the, of, of the next four series derive themselves heavily from their Super Sentai basis. Decker Ranger, in example, is considered one of the best Super Sentai series ever made, and its writer... Um, Narakisa Arakawa is held in pretty high regard as basically the guy who remembers everything Super Sentai. And some of that translates into SPD, but in this case, Bruce Kalish was so new to the show that it was more painted in broad strokes. Every character here, aside from Doggy Kruger, but he's good in either adaptation, is painted in a broad stroke of their Sentai self, but has a unique character to them. Right. SPD is actually my favorite, one of my favorite seasons because of one character, and that's Sky. He's probably my favorite Blue Ranger out of every um, Blue Ranger in Power Rangers because he has such a great character arc, I believe. Oh, yeah, definitely one of the best. I mean, he starts off as this arrogant dick, and basically Kruger knows that he needs to be humbled until eventually... You know, through all the trials and tribulations and learning what it means to be a team, he finally gets to achieve the position of Red Ranger he so desires. Like this he, is, he starts off as be, wanting to be like his father, but in all the wrong for all the wrong reasons. But by the end of the series, you realize he realizes that what his father stood for wasn't the color, but you know the the duty and the duty for his job, and that's what allows him to fully become a Red Ranger. Mm. Right. He, more than any of the other Power Rangers, certainly earns his position among the team. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It, he's a, it's a great character. It's just another case where I unfortunately look at him a little differently now because of the actor. Yeah, Chris Violette was in um, Star Trek Discovery, and including their Mirror Universe episodes. Oh, that's uh, no, what I he meant- was? Oh, yeah. I think yeah. I know who you're talking about no. now. Uh, no, I meant that well, as much as I hate to say this, he said some stuff online about a year ago which suggests he's a 9-11 truther. Oh. Mm. Oh, good lord. Um, yeah. Well, uh, I, guess, I guess that explains why Star Trek Discovery is reshaping its second season. <laughs> the thing with me on SPD is that this is this is one of the few series that I haven't seen all the way through. Like, I, even though I didn't really, like, care much for Lightspeed Rescue, I still went back and watched all the way through. This one... I didn't, because when I was watching it, like, as a kid, I kind of really didn't care for um, the idea for the season. Again, it's another civilian task force, um, and, and living in, like, with aliens and whatnot, I just, I didn't like the direction it was going with, and I can't really comment too, too much, because I haven't really seen the entire season, but it just, to me, felt like they were trying to do something kind of very very different from power rangers than than what i wanted at the time i can't really comment too much on that but also i i I hated the idea of a doggy kruger because that it didn't look convincing whatsoever 
you should see the deck eraser version that's less convincing oh yeah, yeah. no I, I i saw it it, it, it it's it, it sucks on both ends i'm just saying like as a kid the reason why i stopped was it just I, I don't know why i didn't stop with ninja storm maybe i was more tolerant of a guinea pig back then but like it just it, there there's a lot of stuff that SPD uh, I wanted something different and I didn't get it and again it just me being a kid I, I'd have to go back and watch it. Honestly, yeah. if you watch Power Rangers, you're gonna have to do a lot of like suspension of disbelief when you watch any Power Rangers season. Well, yeah, yeah. And, uh, again, a lot of this is just stuff that I wasn't. I I have nitpicks and pet peeves. And a lot of them stemmed from when I was a kid uh, watching SPD come out and expecting something different than what I got. My SPD. only pet peeve is just don't bore me. Like, Ninja Storm bored me, so I'm all like, yeah, I don't like Ninja Storm. So, and it's pretty hard to bore me. SPD is also the first season in a while where the effects work for a lot of the... Power Rangers original uh, stunts and action scenes take a severe downgrade, especially their use of explosions. The fandom has termed the phenomena Cal explosions after, um, since you know the pro- it's the producer the the buck stops with him. But it was actually the cause of the previous stunt directors for the show, Koichi Sakamoto and Makoto Yokohama, moving on to do other things. Koichi Sakamoto beginning with Ninja Storm, was kicked upstairs to be one of the show's producers, leaving Makoto Yokohama as the main stunt director for Ninja Storm and Wild Force. He, Yokohama, in turn, went off to do the Garo franchise at the, around the same time SPD's production was starting up. So that left a man named Mark Harris, who had come on as the secondary stunt director in Ninja Storm, to take the head position. And his stunt effects have not improved well over the decades it's a like you have this connecting shot of um enemies firing at the team and then they're blown up in slow motion back explosions and all of these small interconnecting fire that always seems so grandiose and either people are not injured or they are injured when they shouldn't be and it's just it's just a major mess (laughs) people have actually ended up confusing this with koichi sakamoto's own use of stunt work but His is a lot more consistent in how he uses the explosions, as usually when people are evading fire and not being affected by it, and when it's doing the big things, it's when they're being their absolute badass and standing tall, whereas when you have the same type of FX work in Mark Harris's work, it's when everybody gets knocked around and blown apart. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. He definitely went overboard. Though, I can look past the effects work mainly for the character dynamics. Because one thing I like about SPD is, you know how at pretty much every Ranger season, they almost always start off as all buddy-buddy, oh, we're such good friends? At the start of SPD, none of the team really likes each other, and that adds to their growth. Mm-hmm. Um, I can certainly agree with that. And, and back on the point of effects work, I think that's another thing that kind of threw me off the show. There are certain seasons... When watching uh, back to back, you can see the the budget or the show take a hit. Um, obviously, Turbo was one of them, SPD was one of them, and Operation Overdrive was the biggest hit. Yeah, we'll get to that one. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, also, another thing that I'm noticing, I'm looking at the Power Rangers wiki right now, but there are a lot of Rangers. There's like at least ten of them. In the Sentai, uh, there's two hundred total, and Deca Ranger, Deca being. 10 they actually included 10 rangers including their film and special events so it's a main team of five plus the white sixth ranger plus the extra ranger which is the shadow ranger equivalent and then deca swan which is cat's equivalent who only showed up a few times because her counterpart doesn't like to transform Mm -hmm. then you have the movie exclusive ones Uh. which rounded out to a full 10 oh well we still got 10 here if we count the the silver ranger that appeared with sam at the final episode and can we count boom's costume as a 10th i think we count kelson henderson's transformation as being ninja steel based as kim was just wanting to be a ranger but not being able to achieve it which was actually in part of sentai story adaptation but you know he's definitely that in spirit at that point 
Uh, in, in addition to that, like you have the the whole thing of SPD was you had Ranger teams, and there was the A team and the B team. Oh, I get it. Okay. It, yeah. it, it was basically you were employing squads of Rangers, which to me at the time was cheapening the idea of being a Ranger when you have that many. Looking back, it, it actually is more awesome than I thought it was, but... Like as a kid, the the spe- the the idea of Ranger teams being special was thrown out the window because there was like so many. It's almost like Common Rider Gaim, where they kept throwing so much at you. Uh, granted, Common Rider Gaim was pretty good, but and yeah. it's not even the highest number of riders of Common Rider for that series. But that is neither here nor there. Yeah, it's all right. It, tangent, but yeah. Yeah. All right then. Power Rangers Mystic Force, or from what I've seen, Power Rangers with superhero capes. It basically, and... the, I got explanations for this one too. Um, basically, the Sentai they were ba- they were doing this off of was very heavily influenced by Harry Potter. Ah, uh, mm-hmm. oh, that's cool. Power Rangers mixed with wizards. That sounds awesome. The basis there is each of the Rangers is actually. The, the the children of a powerful magic user of the human world and one of the deities of magic. So basically, when their mom gets uh, kidnapped, they have to learn the powers of their legacy to uh, become superheroes and defend the world against the reemergence of the minions of hell. This is a very brief version of the Sentai, but that's basically the story, and it it did not work as effectively as they wanted it to. It basically, it got over-convoluted of of its nature, and it over-focused on the Red Ranger to the detriment of most of the rest of the cast, which is which explains why in Mystic Force you also had that happen with their Red Ranger, Nick. They, they had other stuff they wanted to do with everybody, but they had too much footage of the Red Ranger that they basically had to write a book adaptation of the series only focused around Nick being the sole special one of that kind of storyline. Mm-hmm. You can also blame Disney on cutting this number of episodes back from 38 a season to 32 a season, so they had to condense a lot and cut out some plot points. Yeah, mm-hmm. that definitely helped uh, hurt the overall lore feeling because... When you look at Mystic Force, it's like the main rangers are there, but they're dealing with so many sins of the past from this previous conflict with the monsters of the series that it's less their series and more dealing with the mop-up of this previous magical conflict. Mm-hmm. Uh, unfortunately, I have never seen this season, so I... I, I can't even add anything, unfortunately. That's okay, Zenith. Don't worry. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I agree with um, Jim in saying that cutting it down from 38 to 32 really was a big detriment to this series and the next several. Yeah, but that sounds so cool. Power Rangers mixed with Harry Potter. That would have been amazing to see. It would have been, but there was just a lot that that hinders it. Like, um, I don't know if any of you guys watch the Disney Brain. He does a YouTube channel. He sometimes talks about Power Ranger series. And he points out a lot of the flaws with uh, Nick the Red Ranger. Like in the first episode, when they're getting introduced to all the mystical aspects around them, um, Udana, their mentor, says that to harness magic, all they have to do is believe in magic. And Nick <laughs> refuses. Yeah. What? <laughs> yeah, it's that stupid. The Sentai series in tandem used courage and bravery as a initial conduit to getting them in, ta- in tune with their powers, so yeah, they could have easily done that, but I guess they just wanted to homage the song. Probably, but yeah, and even then, Nick refuses to believe, even though he has seen, and is seeing magical, supernatural events happening in front of them, which so, makes him come So he's off kind of like Seto Kaiba, in a sense, in which like, he denies about his Egyptian heritage, even though there's proof of it every time that the pharaoh in Ishizu shows up. Except that's on, dub only Seto Kaiba because sub uh, original series Seto Kaiba was actually accepting of magic once he witnessed it. Yeah, I, I do know about that now, but you know, I was I was referring to four kids Seto Kaiba. Fair enough. Another another noteworthy thing about Mystic Force is that it's the first season where they stopped using Ron Wasserman songs. Ron Wasserman hadn't been a regular. Someone else did the music for. Um, 
mid in space through Wild Force, and then you know, completely different people for Disney for the Disney era as well. But he came back to write SBD's theme song. Okay, so um, he hasn't been back to doing Power Rangers music since, right? He submitted a song for Mystic Force, but then has not had involvement. No. Okay. No, I. I t- as good as Ron Wasserman is, I really don't like the SPD theme song. Um, maybe it's just the way it opens and in, in the, the 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 odd uh, offbeat tempo. It just it does not feel like a good opening to me. I'm okay with that. I'm not that big on the Mystic Force theme song. It just seems like I don't know if they were going for like some kind of tribal or maybe Celtic feel with it, but it just feels off. It's it better than a me. rap song. It's it better than a rap song. Yes. You're not gonna. Uh. <laughs> I'm True. sensing a hint towards an upcoming series. Am I? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, but still, I mean, I would have. You know what? I, in, in a sense, I. You know, I really wish that Mystic Force would have worked because just those two combinations would sounded so awesome. But sadly, from I, what go ahead. I personally rated a four as it's not terrible, but it does not live up to its potential. Ah, bummer. All right, yeah. let's go to the next one. Power Ranger, uh, Power Rangers Operation Overdrive. Okay, can we okay. skip this? This is my chance to shine because this is the last series that I've seen from Power Rangers, and I need to I need to frame something in your minds. Go here ahead, please. I, I go ahead. This is the series that killed Power Rangers for me. When I was a kid, uh, watching it for the first time, they had all these promotions about like, oh, this is a, about a treasure hunter themed series and in knowing power rangers and how they do stuff i'm like okay well uh hunting for treasure and fighting villains like that feels right up the alley yeah almost and... it feels like one piece mixed with power rangers exactly yeah. um and I'll, I'll get back to that in a second but so you start off and it's it's like an indiana jones themed thing but the first thing i noticed was how much the budget tanked because nothing looks convincing it, it it just it looked so cheap and so so poorly made that i i was just like oh I, I was so ticked off by it but it, it there's four or like five groups of villains in this and they're all just trying to find treasure and there's no coherence whatsoever through anything it is just a mess of a show. I watched one episode. One episode just because I, I wanted to get into it. I could not get past that first episode. And it doesn't get any better. And part of the problem is it has the worst opening theme song I have ever heard. Now, you mentioned One Piece. And, and the One Piece pirate rap is infamous for being bad. Yes. Overdrives is worse. Yeah. yeah. Overdrives is worse. Yeah. You take... A rap song, which for children's television, like uh, again, anime Power Rangers, it's not gangster. Okay, you know you're not gonna get uh, you're not gonna get the gangster crowd if you include hip hop or whatever. It this just, was unfortunately a fad in the 2000s as well, so it's like you cross strain, the streams with that too. Yeah, yeah, there were a lot of there were a lot of um, theme songs that have rap numbers, Danny Phantom. But those worked at least because they had a beat and they were really well produced. But here, the thing is, it's a rap song, but it also tries to use the mystical themes of like Arabian Nights. Like it's it's so disjointed, and they couldn't commit to one thing. And it's just like, but it's supposed to be Indiana Jones theme. Why are you doing a, a like a, a genie in the lamp, like Arabian Nights thing? Like what? What do you want this series to be? If I can get the Sentai angle in on this, they were definitely hamstrung from the series they used, Bokendra, which was all an adventure series. So you ha- you can't make a adventure and treasure-seeking journey across the entire world on a budget where you can't even support you know hiring competent actors disney was tr- at this point was trying flat out to kill the show and this was reflected in the budget they were getting for it 
And basically, that was one of the biggest problems. You, you don't have the number of episodes to properly pace out a series like that. Apparently, from interviews with the writer, with one of the head writers for the show, Jackie Marchland, who had been a writer for Power Rangers since MMPR season three, basically a lot of what she wanted to do to justify the character arcs for the characters and make them likable was left on the cutting room floor, most significantly in the anniversary team up episode for the series Once a Ranger, which just turned into a mess because what was needed to validate it was never included in the final draft. Not to mention Once a Ranger features the the abomination son of Zed and Rita, and dear God, I don't want to think about that thing. Yeah, uh, Thrax, Thrax was a bad idea. Everybody agrees on this. Yeah. Um, it, it's just like, I didn't like any of the characters in Operation Overdrive. I don't like any of the motivations. I don't like the fact that they genetically alter them um, at a molecular level, just to give them superpowers to be treasure hunters, but also a civilian task force. Like, it doesn't make sense. Mm-hmm. The disparate elements don't fit together very well. Not the worst I've found. I personally like Jungle Fury less, as I don't like the main cast. And fair enough, there there are otherwise some very good. There are some good things about Jungle Fury, but it probably doesn't help that there's been a stigma on the characters as well. Samuel Benta at the Paramorphicon when his team was the thing um, actually stole something that was going to charity and that definitely hurt reception to the series heavily when that got circulated. Yeah, complete douchebag behavior on his part. Oh boy. So thank you for your in-depth discussion about Overdrive, Zenith. Really do appreciate it. So let's move over to Jungle Fury. Another mess series, in my opinion. I thought I, it was pretty good. Uh, please share I it with really, us. Well, I mean, it, it was uh, it, it, the character interactions were great, especially with uh, with the Red Ranger trying to redeem the villain, even though the villain was a complete jerk to him from the start. And it, it really gives the um, it really uh, drives through the theme of redemption. And even if you do something horrible, even if you were someone bad yesterday, it's never too late to start over and work from the bottom again. Which is what happens at the end. the The main villain uh, of the series, which who was a jerk at the start, they um, he ends up going back to like the uh, karate school, the martial arts school. And he starts over from the bottom, and he's he's like, okay, I, I'm I'm humbled now, so I want to be a better person now. Also, it has one of my favorite mentors of the um, franchise, RJ. Yeah, RJ's cool. Just, and, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, right, go ahead. I was gonna say RJ is definitely cool. He, I like his laid back attitude and his way of like teaching people through unconventional means. And I do agree that uh, the redemption angle Casey's going for with Jared when he's possessed. That has a nice touch, but I don't know. That just seems to be, like, seems like they were throwing a lot of stuff out that just didn't fit. Especially doesn't help that sometimes messages come off as contradictory, like, uh, you know, one episode, RJ is telling them that they can function fine if they don't need to rely so much on their animal spirits. And then the next episode, he says, you're nothing without your animal spirit. I mean, that could have been hindered because of the writer's strike, but it just made things seem a little disjointed. Yeah, that's the problem. A lot of people blame the issues of the series on the 2008 writer strike but by production scheduling most of the early side of the show was already written by the time the writer strike hit it's the tail end of the show which would have been harmed from that and that tail end of the show is where people say the show get good so that's not really a defense of that personally i just i am irritated through the i am very irritated by this team i believe in the moral event horizon by which it the there reaches a point where you cannot redeem a character and gerard has the problem of you often cannot distinguish what are his actions and what are the and what is the actions of the dai shi the entity the big bad of the series which is possessing him and it doesn't help that all of his disciples which are leading him towards evil are let are always of the nature of we are evil because we are evil and we are doing this for evil's sake and like that reads horribly in comparison to all of these other nuanced villains we've had and even those in the last show who were just personally greedy and were working to claim this artifact of great power it's like 
why are you actually doing this? Yeah. What oh, motivation yeah. do you have to be evil beyond being evil? Because evil people don't see themselves as evil. Right. The villains are bland. I think it could have been helped if, because they're all animals, maybe they could have justified it by saying they want revenge against humanity for, you know, using them as food and hunting them for sport and wiping out their ecosystems and environments so they can build their own houses. That would have made sense, in my opinion. Hell, I like Lothor more in comparison because at the very least he was entertaining and he came off as a very selfish individual and half of what he was doing was in fact revenge from being thrown out and being denied the power he wanted earlier in, earlier in his life. There was more nuance there than seemed to come from these guys. Yeah. Um, and from a real world perspective, Overdrive almost got the, the franchise canceled. This is well known. Jungle Fury and RPM were greenlit as part of a two-season extension with the potential for more se seasons to continue onwards if they did well in, from a European audience. Jungle Fury did not go well over with anyone at the time, and basically all marketing for the series ended with, ju with Jungle Fury. All running of previous episodes from previous seasons or even reruns of, Jungle, of even Jungle Fury ended with Jungle Fury. All Power Rangers was, after Jungle Fury was just shunted to one time slot. It ran there, it ran nowhere else. So basically Jungle Fury's reception, even if, even if it has changed in time, was responsible for saying, yeah, no, past this two series, we're not doing any more Power Rangers stuff. We're canceling the franchise wholesale. Yeah. So I guess, you know, no, I guess nothing much to say about that. So let's go over to the final season of Power Rangers that was owned by Disney right before going over to Nickelodeon. So Power Rangers RPM. RPM is another in space in regards to, okay, this is going to be the last of the franchise. So we're going to do what we always wanted to do. Go as dark as we always wanted to do. Do all these nuanced things we always wanted to. And we have been being held by because we have to sell the next series. Unfortunately, a lot of people didn't watch it because, as I said, after Jungle Fury, all marketing for the franchise pretty much died. The only one who did any marketing for it was Bandai of America. And uh, I've, I have a history with Bandai of America. The fact that they have now lost the Power Rangers toy license to Hasbro tell, can kind of tell you how bad they have been about managing um, anything Power Rangers related. In fact, there's a lot of negativity towards them because of how awful the toys have gotten. But yeah, they were the only ones to letting people know RPM even existed. Yeah, this is a shame. I mean, because RPM is, in my opinion, tied with SPD as the best series of the franchise. It's RPM basically story Power Rangers and Mad Max. Yeah, it's basically, what if the villains actually won? And putting... The heroes on the line of this is the last known city of humanity. We've got to defend it from the robot apocalypse. As in the in the uh, backstory for the show, a virus called Vengex, which shares the name of the villain from the episode Forever Red during Wild Force, um, infects all known computer systems and proceeds to appear to take over the world. Now, there are a lot of signs throughout the series that he didn't actually take over the world, but just claimed enough territory. So from our perspective, everything else, everything that's left over is a city uh, contained within an energy shield that is their only defense. And any time his robot minions enter the city, that's when the Power Rangers have to get involved. With the bigger story about it being of the team's mentor, Dr. K, who was a child kidnapped in, like, before she even broke 10, and what had to use her advanced intelligence to basically um, build things for a organization called Alphabet Soup, who presumably wanted to use them to rule the world. Unfortunately, they kept her so contained that her own desires to get outside and see the world eventually led her to releasing Vengex in the first place as he was their doomsday weapon. Yeah. Fortunately, she was also the inventor of the Power Ranger powers, which presumably in Alphabet Soup's plans would have been to engineer a crisis and then be responsible for their salvation and take over the world that way. But 
the plot de- the plot about that was never fully developed. Yeah. So this is a good re- lesson that Power Rangers teaches kids: never trust shadowy government agencies, or you'll or it'll bring about Armageddon. There's a lot of callbacks to previous series too in RPM's overarching story. Case in points, um, you see elements of Overdrive. The robot apocalypse thing is actually tied back into elements of SPD's backstory. You see Jungle Karma Pizza from Jungle Fury in the background of a few shots showing that it had to um, exist in the same universe. And there's a lot of themes and ties into um, one of the best scenes in the series. It Several of them, in fact, are Dr. K logically going over elements of the Power Rangers universe from her perspective of someone who didn't know what a Power Ranger was and yet had to um, discover, research, and invent uh, powers and abilities that are basically Ranger powers. She keeps referring to the main um, elements that powers the Ranger tech as a biofield, which when you look at it, at when you look back at, at it in context of the full series, hey, that's the morphing grid. My irritants about this is you see so many of these callback aspects just not straight using the names. And yet when Saban bought the show back after this, producer Jonathan Zacker in his development of Power Rangers Samurai and Megaforce basically said nothing after Wild Force was canon. When RPM's characters, specifically the Red Ranger, was brought in for a team up with Samurai during Samurai, they worked to say it was all set in an alternate continuity distaffed from all every other Power Rangers series, even though that conflicted so heavily with this series and its intentions. Yeah. When, when, as I said earlier, there were all these so, so many seeded story elements that showed that it was more than capable of them saying that Vengex's world conquest just hadn't gotten as far as everybody within his domain thought it was. In fact, his... Avengers' final plan of the series is to basically convert all of humanity in the dome into cyberized sleeper agents that would be indistinguishable from humans. And you think, in context to that, it's like, why would you actually want that or need this number of them to invade a city when a smaller number of them would do the same job? And then you realize, unless he's going to use them to invade larger populaces of humanity to act as subversive agents. And then you get this bigger explosion of understanding that Vengex's big plan with them was just delay them until he could uh, take over. And you, you then realize that the RPM Rangers in this stand, if the rest of the world isn't actually conquered, is still important as it prevents Vengex from actually being able to full on take over the world. I never considered that. Well, neither did Saban when they bought the show back, so now it's out of canon with everything else. Uh, yeah. All right, so um, does anybody else have any further thoughts about RPM right before I move over to the next stuff? Nope. Nope. Okay. So finally, we can move over to the Nickelodeon stuff, and we start things off with Power Ranger Samurai. So okay, I have a lot to say about this because I am a huge Shinkenja fan. Sure, I am. Right probably there. my favorite Super Sentai series, and they completely botched it for Samurai. All right, and partially because Shinkenja was such a, you know, it's so Japanese. It's such an Asian themed show that a lot of the themes don't transfer well to a Western audience. Yeah, you kind of have a lot of that problem, but the central focus of the story and its Red Ranger, that was adaptable, and they screwed it up. All right, so let me just give you my thoughts on Samurai right before you guys do, because, like I said before, this was the very first... Uh, Power Ranger series that I got back to ever since the original and I had not seen anything else since so when I got back to it I was like okay I want to see how Nickelodeon does their version of Power Rangers and this was in 2011 this was when Nickelodeon was not in its high point they wouldn't get into this high point until a year later when Core and the 2012 TMNT came out 
So after watching this, and then I was, you know, I finished watched I finished watching the original, and then I watched Samurai, and then when I f saw Samurai, it was trying to be like a brighter tone. It was supposed to be like funny and lighthearted, and it was trying to put in these Japanese things like samurais, and then it was supposed to be like the sense of oh well, you know, th this um. You know this this villain, uh, you know, is gonna be, you know, is battling the dark forces of the netherworld, and th you know, it's like when I saw it, it was like, I, I was kind of bored with it. I at the same time, I th I thought it was like really cool that they were able to get like these samurai powers. I just never really connected with the show at all. The one thing that I thought was really cool was that they actually brought in continuity from the original series because they actually had the son of um of um bulk skull. And, yeah a skull. skull yeah skull they actually had the son of skull in this show and i thought oh they're, they're it's like a continuation of the original but they don't really do anything much to it and yeah it's it's kind of separated from the main storyline because they adapted the japanese version of the storyline for the main storyline but then they had this side thing where bulk and skulk's the uh, skull's son uh the, does their like little comedy thing and it's kind of removed from yeah. everything that's happening in the main story yeah that's because Paul Fryer did part of Samurai they actually added them in later because they realized all the episodes ran short yeah that's true and, and they would bring back um I believe they bring they brought back Bulk and Skull uh, I, don't, I don't remember it was either in Megaforce or Super Samurai each of these seasons are split over two years, the second half of them naming Super. It's not actually a different season, though. Uh -huh. It's So, yeah, the ending of Samurai has Bulk and Spike and Skull reunite so Skull can grab his kid and go home. Right, I do remember that scene, yeah. So, for the most part, yeah, I, I mean, I thought that, you know, the, the concept of Samurais was actually really cool, but I was just kind of bored with it. I didn't really remember any of the characters very well. I thought that the villain was really cool, but I, there was just nothing about it that clicked for me. The, the thing never... about that is because um, if for, for Shin Kenjir, the story was really, the main story was really, really straightforward. So, okay, uh, evil, uh, the uh, monsters from hell are going to come back. You have to defeat them. It's your job to defeat them. And, um, you know, that's that's just the story. The storyline itself is not really that deep. What Shin Kenjir did was that every episode was very character-centric. So you every episode was like a very dedicated episode to developing the characters and their arcs. So you had like one, one episode where, like, Red and Yellow... Red and Yellow's characters were, uh, you know, had to, you know... Um, kind of developed their relationship with each other or blue and green had a rivalry but they had to work together but for samurai it really doesn't work that well because they they added in like the child characters into the mix where oh, they had to help God, these, yes. this, these this or that child uh like how dare you try to make this child give up his dream of baseball or whatever and um you know instead of those character centric episodes they just had these episodic moments where you know, they have to solve problems, and by the end of that day, the problem solved. Yeah, it, yeah. it, it gave me like a, I think that when I, I think when I was reading articles about when Saban got the rights back to Power Rangers, and then they were gonna, you know, air them on Nickelodeon. I think he there was an interview involving with him stating that he wanted to bring Power Rangers back to its original roots, and this was very apparent that it almost kind of felt like a new generation of Mighty Morphin in a sense. Yeah, that's another thing uh, Samurai suffers from. It's what I call Mighty Morphin Nostalgia Rangers, in that you take a bunch of things that have nothing to do with the original Mighty Morphin and then try and shove them into MMPR Season 1's box, and it clashes horribly. Um, yeah. to, to add on to the Shinkendra details, the greater story, when you look at it, was about tradition versus the modern world, in that uh, the... The Sentai team were the newest successors in this long, hundred years, hundreds of years long campaign of these families doing their duty to prevent these entities from emerging from beyond death because they kept uh, they had they kept failing to beat the big boss that allowed them their prominence. But this modern team. Um, who haven't been the most trained in those traditions keep succeeding because they 
have they are looking at it from a different perspective than those of previous eras like in their series the various mecha combinations they form only the most basic ones they actually had record of the blue ranger the team who was an actor a, a kabuki actor was very creative in his craft and so he was the one who was ultimately responsible for many of these combinations because he saw that he saw that these lesser forms weren't going to work anymore the gold ranger wasn't originally a member of this succession at all. He was a tech junkie, and he found a way to recreate and reinvent and repair all these devices that weren't part of it before. And even they eventually uh, were able to bring in a mech that past cent- past generations weren't able to master. And that was culminated from um, in Shinkenger, the Red Ranger, who is head of the main family, yeah, he's not actually a member of the main family. He has no relation to them. He was adopted and was playing – he was masquerading in the role for his – for was a body purposes, double, basically. For all intents and purposes, adopted sister who was younger than him. So she could actually train herself to have the ability to beat the big bad finally. But – when it came down to it and when she came back, she ultimately couldn't do it because she had not built the camaraderie with everyone else and so um, worked in tandem with her effective brother to actually do it. And finally, they did it by simply driving all of their powers beyond any, the mastery point anyone else did. And in Samurai, you don't get any of this. The siblings are actually siblings, and you don't get an idea of why – that person was absent even with this special training hell you don't even get the point of why there would be special training that she would take on which her brother wouldn't yeah it was just it was just a muddled mess that was just because of how much zachar wanted to keep it in line i don't know if any of you ever read um, amit bomek's pitch but he had an interesting take on that which would have had the red ranger be adopted but his actual blood family would be the family that was allied with the demons So that would give him a confidence, you know, a bit of a crisis in who he was. Was he supposed to be heroic or was he supposed to be in line with these, with who he considered his enemies? And the ironic thing about some of this is the second Bulk and Spike appeared on screen, everyone expected Spike to end up being the Gold Ranger because character-wise, he lined up perfectly, and I mean 100% perfectly, with the Gold Ranger in Shinkenger. Basically, what ended up happening with the Gold Ranger is they ended up splitting his character in two. Antonio, the actual Gold Ranger, who had some of the mannerisms but none of the charm, and then Spike. So you could have had an angle where, had we not later learned that Bulk and Spike were not originally part of the series and just added in where they could, um, you could have led it into Bulk... Spike unveiling that he was the Gold Ranger and that Bulk's attempts at samurai training with him actually kind of helped him and um, then asking him to train the others and getting them to like break from traditional roles roles and maneuvers that had been used for so many centuries that the um, more experienced members of the villain faction would know how to counter and that being an edge they would have over them and being able to more effectively fight them and that would have led in turn to bulk being uh vindicated in that okay he might not be a power ranger but his old dream of being a hero which he kind of got in space that would be continued in that how like tommy and dino thunder he graduated as part of him being a good person into being a mentor for this newer generation and all of that paying off instead of what actually happened and him and Spike being pointless and none of that actually feeling like it meant anything. Well, Wasted Potential is, is the name of the game when it comes to Neo Saban. Yeah. The thing about Shinkenger and Power Ranger Samurai is that a lot of the stuff they brought over didn't make sense when um, they put it into Samurai. Like, when the Gold Ranger joins in Shinkenger, they say, okay, we can't have him as part of our group because he's not part of the families that um, are part of this Samurai group. Which makes sense in the traditionalist sense what, for the theme they were going for, but for the for the American audience or for the Western audience, I should say, 
that doesn't none of that makes any sense whatsoever because it could have had they said had they explained that all of the families were in like that but they never emphasized that part more that right. um the yellow ranger's sister was supposed to be the yellow ranger but she got sick and couldn't do it so the actual yellow ranger took over and said why would have that been important why are these people really here and they don't really explain well the family aspect at all right, which exactly. could have, which and, could why and why does a white guy have a japanese last name yeah, why does a white, blue-eyed, blonde-haired guy actually part of the Japan uh, actually part of a Japanese ancestry? And again, they could have explained that away had they just made him adopted and his sister actually being Japanese. Yeah, I mean, well, they made they really needed to. Um, this is one of those times where they really needed to localize because when I watch Shin Kenjir, I'm from a pretty traditionalist Asian family too. So when I watch Shin Kenjir, it really resonated with me, especially. Um, the Red Ranger's personality because after it's revealed that he's essentially just a body double, he basically says, well, I've already done what was expected of me. I really have, I'm at a loss as to what to do now, but they didn't have that in the uh, in the um, adaptation, and this is one of those times where they really needed to not stick to whatever Samurai had and uh, whatever Shinkendra had and try to do their own thing, but you know. Honestly, I wish they would have jumped Jaden and just had Lauren as the Red Ranger because she was like the best character on the show. Yeah, I mean, it, they've done girls in guys' suits before. Uh, Lightspeed Rescue, Time Force, the original MMPR all, all had that happen. And there would no not really been a problem. Just cast a bit taller of an actress than they usually do, and that would have worked fine. Yeah. So Samurai concluded the series with the Christmas special, and I was like, oh, I remember the Power Rangers Christmas special that they had back in the 90s, where, you know, it was Alpha 5 and all that stuff. And I decided to watch this, and my god, it's one of the worst Christmas specials I've ever seen. It's nothing more than just a clip show of everything that happened previously, and them just, re you know, looking back on it with fond, mem like, fond memories. It's like, that is just so lame. I actually, I think I even included that in like my top 10 worst Nickelodeon Christmas specials of all time list. Power Rangers has never made a single good Christmas or holiday special. I apologize for cutting in you there. That's what I was going to say. And it is consistent. And that is why they stopped making them after Zeo's. Well, I think it, they, guess what? They, they, did an, they did another one in Megaforce and that one is even worse. And they did them in Dino Charge and Ninja Steel as well. I really do think it's because of Nickelodeon's mandate over Christmas episodes because Japan, Sentai, they do have Christmas episodes. You know where they're usually timed around? Well, I'll give you a hint. The It's usually around the early 40s and they go all out for them. The Psycho Rangers in In Space was originally a Christmas episode for Super Sentai. That's usually their big budget, do do the biggest event they can before the finale of the series. Hmm, interesting. Okay, so, yeah, do we, uh, do, I guess, we, uh, let's quickly discuss about Super Samurai. More of the same as Samurai? Yeah, pretty much, it's more of the same. Yeah. It is Samurai. There's no yeah. point in distinguishing them with the title. It's the same season. All right, yeah. let's let's go over to Megaforce. So I feel that this one was slightly better, but not by a lot. S spam Sentai footage. That's all they did with these seasons because you were trying to adapt 100 episodes plus aspects of the movies into 40 episodes. You couldn't do it. You could never possibly do that confidently. It's why at the 32 episode points for the Disney seasons where the show was becoming so compressed, you could barely tell a competent story. Hmm. Yeah. And also one of the additional characters in Megaforce was a robot. And I thought this is Which weird. A uh, Robo Knight. Yeah. Well, to right, be the fair, robot yeah. had more personality than any of the other rangers in that season. Yeah, yeah. and and, and, and I also like to and, and, and also I thought his theme song was pretty cool. Robo Knight wasn't originally a robot in the Sentai. He was a sentient Zord that was granted a human form by the will of the Earth, which is a sentient being in the Super Sentai universe, as a ancestral protector who was actually betrayed by his original holder, who was the actual big bad of the series, who was... Okay, the heroes of the series are angels, guardian angels of the Earth. Their big bad is basically Lucifer. 
Whoa, why didn't we get that? That sounds cool. His name was Vrak. Whoa. Yeah. Yeah, so basically it's a whole betrayal story in that the big bad of the series, his name is Brajira, but his, his, all the villains of that Sentai are based off of movie names. His was na based off of the movie Brazil, which, uh, if you've ever seen Brazil, is pretty screwed up. It is screwed but yeah, up. But yeah, that's... It, he basically, he was... The... Brajira was manipulating the first two enemy factions of that series to his own ends to remove the Guardian Angels after he broke their connection to basically heaven it's actually not stated to be heaven but it's basically heaven um so he could finally do what he wanted to and destroy the earth in a twisted perspective of that would finally bring it peace for all time <laughs> and uh the third enemy faction was actually after they initially defeated him and he got captured by that the third faction of robots and techno form for their own schemes so they kind of fell as filler. The show pretty much reflectively, when it was adapted, kind of did the same thing with when they shoved them in, which they honestly could have skipped past them and it would, the show would have been the better for it. Mm -hmm. But um, Ghost Sager, this series that I'm referring to, it wasn't that great. Uh, the, the cast themselves were kind of bland. Yeah, they had that's true. I, I mean, I felt that this one, I think this one had even worse um, in terms of like the Power Rangers. Like, I didn't remember a single one of them. Uh, like I said, the only one I remembered was Robo Knight. And I thought that, you know, his design was cool and he had a cool theme song. Um, it was slightly better in terms of the villain, but my god, was it just so dull. And like I said, the Christmas special, which they also ended on a Christmas special, is even worse. It essentially yeah, is about, um, like, Robo Knight traveling over to Africa so that he can be able to share on what the true meaning of Christmas is. And I just thought that that was just so lame. Let's not forget how this supposed anniversary season shits all over the legacy. Like the mentor for this season, Gosei. He's a big head on a wall, supposed to be like Zordon. He says Zordon is, was his mentor. Why did Zordon never mention him before? He said he only awakens when the Earth is in danger. Why did he not awaken any of the other previous times in the other seasons? There's a simple explanation for that. Yes. Uh, yeah, uh, basically back to uh, so The simple explanation is that the season sucks. Yes. <laughs> True. Um, as I was saying, the source material didn't have much character, but they had defined character. Go over to Power Rangers Adaptation, they had nothing. But it's like, even the girls' names were just slight variations and swapped in color from Samurai. They, the basis for Megaforce was, we've got to use this season, we might as well rush through the set side footage and source material we have with little to no care. So it, then, of course, since they later skipped Sentai seasons, the question gets asked, why didn't they just call in the special exception here? And there is no good answer. There is absolutely no good answer. Yeah. And I believe that this was also, uh, you know, from what I remember, uh, Megaforce was the one that held the 20th anniversary reunion special. It did not. Oh, it didn't? Uh, okay, technically Super Megaforce did, because okay. Super Megaforce used a different source material for its footage. And the, so they slotted over there, but just the mega first Megaforce half, they really just didn't care because they wanted to get to Gokaiger's footage in the second half of the series. Oh, okay. Gotcha. And they still didn't use it very well. Gokaiger is the pirates-themed Sentai. Basically, most of the characters draw in original inspiration from the, the main original five from One Piece, so One Piece retrospective from uh, Zenith would be relevant there. And the, the pirates there are trying to find the greatest treasure in the universe, which is hidden on Earth and sealed by the powers of the previous 34 Super Sentai teams, who at the time had lost their powers and been scattered to the universe due to a battle with the um, forces of the Zangyak, who were an interdimension, in, who were a space based invader um, who wanted to conquer Earth. But this battle so severely hamstringed their efforts to do that that we can continue attacking Earth. They had to, over time, pull forces from other uh, battlefronts. So, thus giving the Gokaiger the time to come in and search for this treasure. The Gokaiger's original leader, Aka Red, was actually the spirit of Super Sentai, 
who went out into the universe to recover all the ranger keys, which had been uh, banished across the pla- uh, across the universe from the battle with the super Sent- the battle w- where the super sentai lost the powers, the keys containing all of their powers, and over time. The Gokaidra team met representatives from all 34 previous Super Sentai teams to earn their respect and thus the greater powers of each team. The greater powers being representative of all the growth and advancement each Super Sentai team had performed over their entire storyline. So basically, by them obtaining it, they could then use the full powers of that team. It managed to respectfully homage and have cameos from all of these creators, it is the best anniversary series Toei has ever done, and Megaforce failed entirely in its adaptation of that to an insulting degree, because not only did they throw in all of these 15 Super Sentai teams that had never been adapted for Power Rangers, they couldn't even homage and reference the Power Rangers teams correctly. They threw in homages to... Like all these other series that had no context to either the original or the adaptation or their place in um, Mega Force's story, they just they had it. They threw it in. They went. They to had Amanda, a- They fall out of the sky. How do they survive? No, su- no understanding because they didn't even use the clip from the team of them changing into the team, which used it. Uh, the Blue Ranger goes from being the super smart science person to being a sword master, admits he is, admits he has no training as a sword, and then does shot for shot recreation of something. The Blue Ranger from the Go Kyger team, who is a super master swordsman who needs to do this ridiculous shooting blades at him training to even get better thing, the Mega Force Ranger does that as basic training to make him better than an amateur. This is something that would kill an amateur, and they did it simply because it was cool in the Sentai, lacking the context of why it was cool in the Sentai. They have a freaking quick change episode, which is a tradition in Sentai, but is something that's never done be- been done before in Power Rangers. Hell, um, the Red Ranger, when they finally bring back Robo Knight due to his absence, because during the events of Gokaiger, his counterpart was nothing but a Ranger key, um, they wake him they wake him up from the evil side by the red ranger getting all glowy and hitting him with a uh, dragon ball z-esque punch to wake him up that was a direct sentai adaptation where the reason why the red ranger in that series could do it was because he was an angel like they never explained what um i can't even remember his name troy i don't even yeah i don't even remember uh there was no re- there was no legitimate reason for him to be able to have that power and do this because that was so- from the sentai and yet that was not something they included in the power Rangers adaptation now that ex- think- now, now that that's, that that explains everything because i remember when i first saw that and i was like why does he have that power i don't remember him having it Even i think like james our- bates said that um he wanted troy to be like tapped into the morphing grid but Zacker never let him explain that in the scripts. James Bates also is, like, he admits how bad his story is, his storytelling is, but he is still one of the worst writers for this franchise. You can't really blame him because he was restrained on that, but then he did episodes for Dino Charge, and the Dino Charge episodes were terrible. Yeah, true. I mean, he owns up to his failings, but he still keeps making the failings. Mm. Yeah, this would this would be the last time that I would see anything Power Rangers related until the new movie because this was when I was finished with the Nickelodeon tribute and I was no longer interested in watching any more Power Ranger stuff because I don't know. I think that just I was just drained from it. Like I just found it to be like really dull but at the same time just really confusing and it did not help that that seriously that, that stupid stupid series ended with the christmas special where he went over to africa to teach about the true meaning of christmas that's when I, that was when i was just broken off i was like okay i'm i'm done i'm finished i yeah. I, I, I didn't go back to power rangers for 20 years and it looks like i didn't miss out yeah. this is also where Zachar doubled down on the rpm retcon in the okay one of them one of the power-up megazord combinations for the gokaiger team involved them going 
uh, getting one of the Zord, uh, new Zord based on that from the Gowandra team. The Gowandra's Megazords were all sentient mecha from a parallel universe. That is why Zachar came in and got the whole thing about the RPM universe being uh, another universe. He basically adapted things from the, from the RPM source material that had not been part of Power Rangers' adaptation of that source material. So basically, they then go in Megaforce, they then go to the other universe where um, RPM is now situated and basically see this Zord running around randomly and then just take it. And like, dude, who the hell told you you could do this? In fact, why do you even have RPM's powers if the RPM is not in the same universe? Hell, they actually did this with all the Disney teams. The only Disney era Ranger that actually showed up was um, Casey. Casey from Jungle Fury? I think that's his name. Casey, the Red Ranger of that team? Probably. Yeah. Uh, again, he, you know, when I saw the reunion special, I didn't recognize even, like, most of them. Yeah, but he wasn't in the reunion special. He was in a story adaptation of one of Geki Ranger, Jungle Fury's source materials, ep- uh, episode. He the Basically, the tribute episode to that series. And he showed up in it because he was on the writing staff. Huh. Interesting. According to John... The- According to Jonathan Zacker, he was continuing through and following through with his statement that nothing after Wild Force actually happened. I see. Which is, again, why they were, when we actually get to the big legendary battle team up, according to behind the scenes stuff on this, on the nature of the callbacks, every Disney era ranger was blacklisted from it. Wow. That's sucks. In fact, they, in fact they, they got a lot of people confirming that they wanted to come in and do it. And yet the staff um, said, no, you can't come because we already hit our quota. Among those was the, the actor for the Titanium Ranger, he, you know, Power Rangers' first original Ranger. He wanted to come back for that special. They didn't let him. In fact, the entire thing about the legendary battle cameos is insulting because the idea did not come from the source material they were adapting. Gokaiger's many cameos of previous Sentai members, yeah, they didn't get the, give them the idea to actually do that for Power Rangers. No, they got they took on the suggestion and idea after a fan at a convention asked them if they were going to do that. But by the time they actually sent the message, they had already allocated all of the budget to the series, so the few they did get was an entire afterthought. And you know where the map the most budget for the series went? Recreating the old Sentai suits. Nope. No. No. Most of the budget to the series went to the filler episode, The Perfect Storm, where the little CGI robot buddy, Tenso, has a day out in the world. And their budget was spent on doing the CGI for that little robot walking around downtown and interacting with people. Oh, my God. Really? My God. Yeah, it re- what? It really, it really disappoints me what they did with um, Goku Hydra for this season because I cosplay in my free time and Captain Marvelous, who is the Red Ranger from Goku Hydra, is probably some the character I've cosplayed the most. I bring him to every con. I love Goku Hydra and I was really disappointed in Super Mega Force. Yeah. Yeah. I think everyone was. Yeah. It's a- and of course, the reason the, what makes this worse, ju- yeah, that entire episode, the perfect storm with Tenso wandering around those places, written and directed by Jonathan Zacker. <sighs> Basically, he no he got fired after Megaforce was so reviled, became so reviled by the fandom. It's like there it is it has very few defenders once you learn all of these. Horrible, horrible details about it. Well, not to ca- not to speak badly of others, but I really hope Zachary's been blacklisted in the entertainment industry now, given what he's done. Yeah. Well, <sighs> basically, after that, they tried to win back the fandom's interest in Power Rangers by calling back in Judd Lynn, who, as I've mentioned before, is probably one of the best writers they've had, but it's been years since he was regularly writing, so... When we got to Dino Charge and Ninja Steel, on top of him being hamstrung by executive mandates, he just he just was not a good writer anymore. 
Yeah. Well, at that, at that point, I was pretty much finished with Power Rangers, like I said. So I don't have anything to say about Dino Charge or Ninja Steel. Um, if we're actually on the Dino Charge topic now? Yeah, we are. Go ahead. I released a review collection last December. It took me nine almost hour-long videos to tell how... Oh, God. Oh, God. Dino Charge is almost as big a mess as Megaforce when you get right down to it. Well, maybe it's a good thing I did miss out on it then. Mm. Yeah. Uh, to shorthand it for people who actually didn't watch the series, the French, the series ends in the supercharge half, I'm not, uh, not the first half, um, with them blowing up an artifact made of pure evil when they didn't need to because they had it safely contained and locked away away from the villain so they could easily just dispose of it later. While the villain is somehow towing Earth out of orbit, but is still in the system so they could stop him and all that would happen is the effects of global warming aren't as severe on the planet. They were basically that in still in the um, orbits of the sun, so nothing bad would have happened. And because they destroyed that artifact, it opened up a black hole. It swallowed the villains, it swallowed the planet, the heroes, through their own actions, through no manipulation of the villains, and the series with destroying the planet and killing six billion people. What? Yeah. <laughs> what? This is expected of the competency level seen of them all freaking series. Yeah. Of course, you know how they get around this? Because this dark, it's called the dark energy that they destroyed, is destroyed. The other 10 energy that power the 10 members of the main team can now have the ability to time travel. Oh. There has been no sign at all in the series that these artifacts have that ability. So you're thinking, oh, we can just go back to when he started towing the planet, cut the towing lines, and save the world that way. No, they go back to prehistoric Earth. Because the villain of the series, in this Dino Charge timeline, because it's distaffed from all the other Power Rangers timelines, there's actually a Power Rangers multiverse now, um, he was originally responsible for the dinosaurs dis extermination. Now you think the asteroid he brought down on the planet due to Dino Thunder would be the one responsible for giving the Dino Gems to the world? Yeah, no, the ball of rocks he was towing was not large enough to even, basically we have had space rocks hit the planets in the last year that have been larger than the one who, which um, the villain would have slammed down there. But basically they changed time so he, Events occur, so he never gets hit. Has that rock hit the planet, and so they're ending the series. Yeah, dinosaurs now exist in modern times, even though the dinosaurs were already going extinct when the asteroid hit, and that just sped everything up a lot. So it doesn't work any way around it. But yeah, that's just a small taste of how stupid Dino Charge is. At the end of the day, it sounds Basic like a, it, it sounds like a confusing mess. Uh, I, got, I guess I could have, should have started from the beginning with that. Um, to, to be fair, um, the first season of Dino Charge wasn't bad. It was actually pretty good, and a lot of people liked it. It's just that in the second season, they made a lot of weird choices. Yeah, I think that was because, oh, I remember Palomorphicon just happened. Then uh, Judlin said that Saban was forcing them to put more, you know, kitty-oriented humor into the show, right? It wasn't just that, but... Um, a recent, a recent thing that came out after the show was that Saban was getting discounts and payments from the New Zealand tourism thing by basically saying and referencing New Zealand stuff in the show, which they did throughout it, and it left them with some major, pretty major tax cuts. So, mm. And they were forced in there. One of the rangers was from New Zealand. Um, one of the filler episodes, which actually debuted the Ultra Zord, was more focused on them making a fancy cake, which kept blowing up in people's faces. And it's like, you still had this kind of st stupidity in the first half, but it was less involved with the story and less interfering with it. A lot of people um, put that on uh, the new writing staff because there was a complete writing and directorial staff change between the sides of the seat between the two sections of the season on the plus side it did give us yoshi sudarso so we can be thankful for that 
the Sidarso brothers are pretty much the only good things to come out of the Saban era. In fact, uh, the Neo Saban era, I shouldn't specify. In fact, um, Peter Sidarso has recently uh, commented on. He's not explicit about it, but he's said that the writing on Ninja Steel has been stupid. And that's yeah. someone working on the show itself that is saying that. Yeah, I saw that. So yeah, Dino Charge's main plot is bad guy is after these magic gems. They crash down on the planet in prehistoric times, and um, the keeper of the gems attempts to safeguard them by sending a bomb back up on the ship. The ship is damaged, loses a giant bunch of space rocks. It's not one asteroid, it's a bunch of meteors um, on the planet and devastates it, causing extermination dinosaurs. In modern times, humans find... um, Humans and a revived keeper find the gems and pretty much send up signals that calls the bounty hunter hunting all of them back to the planet. And the length of the show is them trying to defend the gems and get them back for all of their uh, powers and abilities and whatnot. Uh, like the others said, the early side of the show is definitely better, but has a bunch of like stupid moments and issues with the Sentai adaptation, which they could have easily avoided had they like thought a bit more about what they were doing and stayed the course. Arguably, one of the most insulting storylines to the series is actually the Red Rangers, who is trying to find his father, who he thinks was in captured and disabled in this calamity as a uh, calamity about 10 years before the series because he never came home. And all he had left was a journal which had the drawings of one of the villains of the series in it. So early on, you think, oh, he's um, he's like trapped and stuff. And no, nothing comes of it. In fact, his dad is later is later revealed to be the Aqua Ranger. Has not been imprisoned. Has not been limited from coming back. He just abandoned his family. It did not go over well with anybody, and they kind of repeated that same plot line in Ninja Steel. Yeah, basically, if uh, there's not really much to discuss about in terms for Dino Supercharge, I guess we can just go over to Ninja Steel. There is one other thing. Um, the source material they were adapting, Kyoryuger, it had 11 Rangers, with the 11th being basically another Psycho Ranger. Hmm. They ended up not including him in the series at all, but people got really pissed when they learned that because all throughout the first half and the second half of the series, they kept teasing that the character was coming. They, in fact, put the character's name, Talon Ranger, in a bunch of the toy line, and Band of Americans in such a shape that they would not have done that or included those aspects of it if it was not intended to be included, and he never ended up appearing and people got pissed off about that because they basically felt like they had been led on for no reason when in interviews about the series they were told something along those lines was coming to be fair i think that's not all savant's fault because um from what i understand they either didn't get the costume or they couldn't get the rights to it because the ranger that appeared in Kyoryuja for that costume was only in the movie. And that movie had a lot of, like, copyrighted music for it, so it was a lot more work to get the rights to that movie. And they either weren't able to get it in time or weren't able to get the costume in time. So a lot of the rights there, like, you know, when you hear about it, when you hear about the storyline and how they wrote it, is, like, you know, you, you can you could easily blame them. But, I mean, there's a lot of tricky legal ground to go through there, and I don't the think that... The monster counterpart of the same character from that movie was one of the last bad guys they fought. So, no, that's not a full-on defense. And they didn't actually have copyrighted music in that movie. All of Kyoryuja or Gabriel Shub music's music was written and perform- written and developed in-house by Toei, and they wouldn't have been using that the music. And they used... 85% new footage in Dino Charge, so they certainly could have just gotten the suit and shot it themselves. Well, this is just stuff I heard of, um, you know, uh, secondhand. I mean, if they said they, they couldn't get the footage or the suit, they would have just said it straight out. Because hmm. that would have been understandable. Right, that's and abated the anger for everybody. Hell, I wouldn't even sound irritated. 
of it had they done that. But no, they kind of tried to shove it off of as, oh, the Talon Ranger was actually the Silver Ranger when he was evil, when, yeah, no, the sound effect that causes that to be done in the Morphers is done by the transformation trinket related to this specific character, so doesn't quite fit right. Yeah. Power Rangers has a specific, like, habit of only only telling the fans what they want the uh, what um you know stuff that paints them in a better light and keeping almost every all other information away from the fans and it blows up in their faces when it comes out from other sources yep yeah every time all right i think we can start wrapping things up so let's talk about the newest one which is right now is ninja steel and super ninja steel because as of right now power morphers is not even out yet Beast Morphers, and let me say this right straight up. No matter how bad Ninja Steel gets, as far as I've seen in the series, I haven't seen the second half, it cannot possibly be worse than its source material. Its source material was stupid and badly received almost completely across the board. Ninja Ninja, uh, Nin Ninja was actually very... I mean, like, okay, so even in the bad seasons of Sentai, you can find something to like. Nin Ninja is... Nin Ninja commits the cardinal sin that a Sentai series could possibly make. Make the biggest cardinal sin ever, more so than just being bad. It's boring, which is like the the kiss of death when it comes to a uh, Toku show like uh, Super Sentai. It because is arguably the second worst Super Sentai series ever made. It is that bad. Yeah, it's so. I mean, if it was bad. But it had some interesting uh, things where it was funny bad. Okay, you know, you could you could watch it ironically. But it's not even that bad. It's just boring. It's bland. I'm linking two pictures into the chat. They are both of unsold toys, specifically this one toy from the Ninja Steel line. This is during the Toys R Us clearance events where everything was... 30% or less off to just get rid of it. This item did not sell, and this mimicked perfectly what happened to the Bandai of Japan um, toy in, in Ninja, in that the toy line did not sell. It has some of the worst sales scores of Super Sentai in its entirety. Yeah, and right now, um, Deshinta is sending me a picture of it, and from the looks of it, it was, original price was ninety nine ninety nine, and uh, they said after twenty percent off, then you pay this, and now it says after thirty percent off, and from the looks of it, it looks like nobody's buying. That was the last week uh, before Toys R Us closed. Those were not selling. Period. Wow. Yeah, I walked in on the last day, Toys R Us was open. Um, and they were sitting for maybe $15, and still nobody was buying them. That's Damn. sad. <laughs> and the, okay, the toy sales are not always the best metric to a series reception, but I've seen Power Rangers toys for years not move in any of the stores I've been to, and this is the biggest sign that toys like this move best are people are interested in buying them because the show they are part of is interesting and thus you're intrigued enough to buy the merchandise power rangers super sentai common rider ultraman all of these series run off this same concept so better toy sales usually relate to better reception the last few years though it has uh, more been seen as fewer people are buying more because there is not there is no longer a widespread appeal two people watching so it doesn't help the toys themselves are kind of crappy in comparison to their japanese counterparts but that's not a defense in this case yeah so as of right now this is the newest out of the power ranger series and nickelodeon um no longer has like the rights to it now i think that hasbro <laughs> does has, no, Saban no has, longer has the rights. Oh, that's right. Saban no longer has the rights to it. Hasbro does, but it will still be airing on Nickelodeon. Yeah, uh, yeah that's, that's that's not quite what happened. Ben, uh, Saban sold the toy rights to Hasbro, and Hasbro is said to be gaining a influence in the development of the series. It's still going to Nickelodeon. It's still owned by Saban. Saban also has the option to just sell everything wholesale to Hasbro, but to my knowledge, they haven't taken that deal yet. 
No, so I think that they will go into more effect when Beast Morphers airs, and that's going to be yeah. next year. Yeah. yeah, I'm holding out hopes for it, though, because it's based on Go Busters, which is one of my favorite Sentai seasons, so I am really hoping they don't fuck this up. I From what I... I personally didn't like Go Busters because I'd seen its overall story done better elsewhere, and I really did not. I really do not like the cinematography by uh, Go Busters head director. But I understand I'm in the minority on that, and I was rooting for an adaptation because the adaptation is more than capable of fixing anything wrong in the Sentai, as has been shown over all of Power Rangers history. Honestly, being at Power Morphicon. And seeing what Hasbro has planned in terms of toys, toys at least, um, I, I think they'll at least handle it better than Bandai of America did. And I'll, I think they'll definitely. I mean, you can't get much worse than what Neo Saban has made so far. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you could. Well, you can, but you don't expect them to. Yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, the only. Well, I mean, the only way it, it could get worse right now is if they just had like a poop in a bag for thirty minutes. <laughs> <laughs> To conclude our podcast, I guess the only thing we need to talk about next is the movie, the 2017 movie. Oh, um, I've got one thing too. Sure. The Boom Studios comics that have been released the last several years, they have been the best thing since RPM. They honestly understand the spirit and storytelling needed of Power Rangers, even they, if they've been mostly focused on an alternate interpretation of the original Mighty Morphin years. The recent Shattered Grid event that's happened in the comics has been really good and intriguing, and they take a lot of concepts in interesting ways and is the most respectful towards all of Power Rangers. Power Rangers has been in the entire in the entire time Saban's had the show back. So Speaking if you find the comics com- Sorry. So if you find the comics, please look into them. They're worth your time. Okay. Great. Speaking of new things, um, I, I was at PMC and um, I was able to play the um, Heroes of the Grid board game, and it's st- still up on Kickstarter right now. So, if you like board games at all, it's a really good board game, and you should try and support it. All right, sounds great. So now we can talk about the movie. And when I did see the movie, um, I was actually pretty kind of i don't know there was just something about it that it did have like you know the same character names as from mighty morphin but something about it at first didn't really click for me i I just thought that the design of rita repulsa was just really ugly looking like it it just it didn't feel right i think that the time in which it did kind of feel like a power rangers movies was when they started getting their powers and when they started controlling the megazord that was when it felt like power rangers for me but for the most part i i wasn't really that invested in it that's not a problem with a lot of people i personally feel that the script for the movie needed another round with the script with the script doctor because the dialogue didn't sound right a lot of the time. Yeah, and and I know that um, when I first heard about the Power Rangers movie, and they were showing like you know pictures of what the Power Rangers were going to look like and what the suits were going to look like. I think there was like a lot of complaints about like oh you know they made you know the Blue Ranger black and you know they made you know he's going to be completely different now he's autistic and there's this one character who's gay it's like who cares yeah who cares I mean what's wrong that's it was good representation I thought yeah Yeah, the problem with that um, the um, composer for the the Neo Saban era Noam Kniel his like I mentioned earlier before we started the uh, stream his uh, music is painful to my ears the reason the reason i have that is i have a medical condition known as hyperacusis that is common to autistic people the show is actually painful to a lot of people who have autism so if you have this character who's on the spectrum you're getting the autistic representation then why are you encouraging the show to have the work of someone who is lethally dangerous to autistic people yeah, I, I think that they just needed to retool it uh, in a much better sense. Yeah, they definitely should have made it less like a you know angsty teen drama during the first half. Yeah, very angsty. I mean, I can understand like oh you know the characters are not getting along with each other, and I'm like okay this this will be very interesting in which maybe they they don't start off buddy buddy, but they have to work together as a team. But even then, I didn't really like the chemistry of any of the the, the teenagers at all. It, it just kind of felt like it was offhanded. And then, like I said, the only time in which I actually started getting invested was when 
when they got their suits and they got their powers and then when they you know got into the megazord and all that stuff i thought that was cool and you know it felt very power rangers like and you know this whole thing about like rita repulsa going into like a crispy cream it was like what is this this is like man man of steel you know sense of like the ihop thing yeah it was I, hilarious that was, though it was and i give them credit they made rita repulsa threatening i mean she straight up kills people in this movie and it's kind of terrifying at moments yeah, yeah I, I did like that about, about rita but i just didn't like the design i really well, didn't when you look at another angle, it's like it's the remnants of her ranger form as she was their team's Green Ranger who fell to evil. So in context, that kind of feels like better set up for the next movie where they could potentially get in the Tommy storyline and potentially Zed as the corrupter of Rita to evil. But on a movie as the movie on its own, I think it's like teasing for it's it's sequel begging too hard. It's not working hard enough to be a solo standalone story. Yeah, and the fact that we are already getting a sequel pretty soon, I take it that that was what their plan was from the start. Well, there's no guarantees on the sequel. If it's going to happen, it might be with Hasbro's backing instead oh, of Lions yeah, Dances. That's right. They didn't they didn't get the uh, money and revenue from the box office for it to it, it's like on that Pacific Rim borderline between successful and underperforming yeah. all i'm gonna say is if we do get a sequel i really want them to bring in either clancy brown or ron perlman as zed that would be awesome yes i would like that yeah that'd be cool all right so um is there anything else that we need to discuss about power rangers right before we go maybe like top five Oh, yeah, that's right, the top five, yeah. Okay, so top five favorite, um, you know, favorite seasons of Power Rangers. So, uh, Captain Marvelous, why don't we start off with you? Okay, uh, so probably my, my number one pick would be Zeo, uh, then SPD, uh, RPM, and Time Force. And I really don't know for why I picked for number five. Okay, um, Jim, what about you? <laughs> Okay, number one would be a tie between SPD and RPM. Uh, second would be in space, then Dino Thunder, then Zeo, then Time Force. Okay. Uh, Dishinta, what about you? Time Force, in space, RPM in that order, and then my four and five pick shuffles between a lot of people's choices. Zeo, SPD, Dino Thunder, a lot of those just shuffle in for the last two of the top of my top five slots. Okay, and Zenith, what about you? Um, well, favorite is uh, in space. Uh, then I put Time Force. Uh, uh, God, what, what was uh, the other one? Uh, Wild Force. Uh, and then I think Zeo. And I, I, I would have to kind of go back through them because, th oh, yeah, Dino Thunder. Um, but it, a lot, that's really loose for me because, like, there, there are some that I really acknowledge as, like, amazing um, but a lot of them are kind of interchangeable to me. All right. So, yeah, um, I think that, I mean, should we go over, like, the what the worst are? <laughs> no. 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 Okay. We know. Yeah, we know. Mega Force is uncontested yeah, right. in that. Yeah. Okay. Fine. Right. Operation, Over Operation Overdrive. Yeah. All right. So, fine. Operation Overdrive, Mega Force, Samurai. I, yeah. Well, let's, let's just leave it at that. All right, so I think that's pretty much it. So, guys, I want to thank you so much for coming on by. I really do appreciate it. Thanks for having us, Thanks Patty. for having me. No problem. All right, so it's time for plug and promotion time. So, Captain Marvelous, what do you got? Uh, I am on YouTube, uh, you know, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, all as Marvelous and Red. So, if you have time, I do reviews for um, Super Sentai on my YouTube channel. I don't have much on right now because I have, like, a... Uh, this isn't my day job, so I, um, yeah, if you want reviews of Sentai, I've, I've started with the Showa era ones. Okay, great. Uh, what do you got, Jim? Well, continuing in the Power Rangers theme, I'm working on the 11th chapter of Power Rangers Helios, and I'm going to try to have that up before the 25th anniversary special airs on Tuesday. Fantastic. And, uh, what do you got, Dishinta? Um... I am at youtube.com slash Shinja Reviews. I am a regular reviewer of Tokusatsu content, primarily Kamen Rider, Super Sentai, and Power Rangers. Sadly, a lot of my videos are down due to 
the copyright claim apocalypse that's been happening since the beginning of August, but I am working on getting those back up. And you should see most of them throughout September, assuming I don't get any more copyright claims. I am also going to be streaming Zone of the Enders, the second runner, Mars, the first week of September after that game releases in full PlayStation VR. All right, that sounds cool. Uh, what do you got, Zenith? Um, I'm uh, at Twitter at, at Zenith Will Rule, and I also have reviews on YouTube, youtube.com slash Zenith Will Review. Uh, I do anime, video games, history of One Piece, uh, and other stuff. I have the next two episodes pretty much uh, just checking for copyright now. And yeah, the copyright apocalypse is coming back, but it's a lot better than it was before for for history of one piece so look forward to that sometime next month i'm just you know getting the final edits for that in um i also stream on the weekends at uh twitch.tv slash the zenith will rule uh, i'm actually gonna get a overwatch stream in after this and uh yeah just a whole bunch of creative stuff all right cool so next time on Casual Chats, we're going to be discussing about the Mega Man franchise. And I have a very, very special guest to be discussing about that. So that's it, everybody. Let us know in the comments below about what your first introduction of Power Rangers was. What's your favorite season? What's your least favorite season? What's your favorite ranger of each color? What are your thoughts on the movies? So hope to see you around soon, and thank you for listening. Take care. Bye. Bye.